<laughs> almost forgot to put the microphone on. Whoops. Okay, uh, I think that'll do it. <sighs> so, I'm um, back to doing this. Um, I was going to listen to The Running Man today, or at least part one. Part one of The Running Man. Uh, and play some more Death State. Um, part one. Yeah, a couple hours. I don't know how long I'm going to get uh, to in the story, but eh, we'll figure it out. Wow, really? This book is like six and a half, oh, almost seven hours. Uh, yeah, so um, the version I'm listening to is the one bit read by Bob Askey. Um, nobody's probably familiar with him unless you're really into audiobooks and into pirating audiobooks because uh, he reads basically for the National Library for the Blind uh, one of those volunteer services uh, not unlike LibriVox but much older and actually they have some really good readers I like Bob Askey I think he does a perfect job with this and the long walk and also Rage Probably road work too, but man, that book is so fucking depressing. I can't go back and ever, ever read and or listen to that again. Um, so anyways, um, I'm going to go with probably my favorite in there. I don't know. Long Walk is really fucking good, but The Running Man is really fucking good too. Uh, it's not, I'm, yeah, let's not even compare it to the fucking Schwarzenegger film, which is sort of a travesty, but whatever. Let's go. Uh, shit. Um, oh yeah, so... I'm gonna try, like, while I'm doing this, I'm gonna try to, uh, do a Desecration 3 run and trying to get to the secret end boss. But to do that, I can't play... I can't play the Flooded Temple of whatever this hell, hell place is. Uh, I have to do it in the first one because there's something on the... F Anyways, don't worry about it. Just suffice to say, I have to do, uh, the other thing first. I can't do this. But, like, yeah. Other than that, um... Enjoy The Running Man. The Running Man. Richard Bachman. Welcome to America in 2025. Oh. When the best men don't run for president, they run for their lives. Minus 100 and counting. There we go. That's better. She was squinting at the thermometer in the white light coming through the window. Beyond her, in the drizzle, the other high rises in Co-op City ah. was like the gray turrets of a penitentiary. Below, in the air shaft, clotheslines flapped with ragged wash. Rats and plump alley cats circulated through the garbage. She looked at her husband. He was seated at the table, staring up at the freebie with steady, vacant concentration. He had been watching it for weeks now. It wasn't like him. He hated it, always had. Of course, every development apartment had one. It was the law, but it was still legal to turn them off. The compulsory benefit bill of 2021 had failed to get the required two-thirds majority by six votes. Ordinarily, they never watched it. But ever since Kathy had gotten sick, he had been watching the big money giveaways. It filled her with sick fear. Behind the compulsive shrieking of the halftime announcer narrating the latest newsy flick, Kathy's flu horse and wailing went on and on. How bad is it? Richards asked. Not so bad. Don't shit me. It's 104. He brought both fists down on the table. A plastic dish jumped into the air and clattered down. We'll get a doctor. Try not to worry so much. Listen. She began to babble frantically to distract him. He had turned around and was watching the freebie again. Halftime was over and the game was on again. This wasn't one of the big ones, of course, just a cheap daytime come on called Treadmill Du Bucks. They accepted only chronic heart, liver, or lung patients, sometimes throwing in a grip for comic relief. Every minute the contestant could stay on the treadmill, keeping up a steady flow of chatter with the MC. He won ten dollars. Every two minutes, the MC asked a bonus question in the contestant's category. The current pal, a heart murmur from Hackensack, was an American history buff, which was worth $50. If the contestant, dizzy, out of breath, heart doing fantastic rubber acrobatics in his chest, missed the question, $50 was deducted from his winnings, and the treadmill was speeded up. We'll get along, Ben. We will, really. I, I'll... You'll what? 
Josh. One way or the other, you'll have to see her through this. She had never really been a handsome woman, and in the years since her husband had not worked, she had grown scrawny. But in this moment, she looks beautiful, imperious. I won't take it. I'd rather sell the gubby a two-dollar piece of tail when he comes to the door and send him back with his dirty blood money in his pocket. Should I take a bounty on my man? He turned on her, grim and humorless, clutching something that set him apart. An invisible something for which the network had ruthlessly calculated. He was a dinosaur in this time. Not a big one, but still a throwback, an embarrassment, perhaps a danger. Big clouds condense around small particles. He gestured at the bedroom. How about her in an unmarked pauper's grave? Does that appeal to you? It left her with only the argument of insensate sorrow. Her face cracked and dissolved into tears. Man, this is just what they want for people like us, like you. Maybe they won't take me, he said, opening the door. Maybe I don't have whatever it is they look for. If you go now, they'll kill you. And I'll be here watching it. Do you want me watching that with her in the next room? She was hardly coherent through her tears. I want her to go on living. He tried to close the door, but she put her body in the way. Give me a kiss before you go, then. He kissed her. Down the hall, Mrs. Jenner opened her door and peered out. The rich odor of corned beef and cabbage, tantalizing, maddening, drifted to them. Mrs. Jenner did well. She helped out at the local discount drug and had an almost uncanny eye for illegal card carriers. You'll take the money? Richards asked. You won't do anything stupid. I'll take it, she whispered. You know I'll take it. He clutched her awkwardly, then turned away quickly with no grace and plunged down the crazily slanting, ill-lighted stairwell. She stood in the doorway, shaken by soundless sobs until she heard the door slam hollowly five flights down. And then she put her apron up to her face. She was still clutching the thermometer she had used to take the baby's temperature. Mrs. Jenner crept up softly and twitched the apron. Dearie, she whispered, I can put you on the black market penicillin when the money gets here. Real cheap, good quality. Get out, she screamed at her. Mrs. Jenner recoiled, her upper lip raising instinctively away from the blackened stumps of her teeth. Just trying to help, she muttered, and scurried back to her room. Barely muffled by the thin plaster wood, Kathy's wails continued. Mrs. Jenner's freebie blared and hooted. The contestant on Treadmill to Bucks had just missed a bonus question and had had a heart attack simultaneously. He was being carried off on a rubber stretcher while the audience applauded. Upper lip rising and falling metronomically. Mrs. Jenner wrote Sheila Richards' name down in her notebook. We'll see, she said to no one. We'll just see, Mrs. Smells So Sweet. She closed the notebook with a vicious snap and settled down to watch the next game. Minus 099 and counting. The drizzle had deepened into a steady rain by the time Richards hit the street. The big smoke dokes for hallucinogenic jokes thermometer across the street stood at 51 degrees. Just the right temp to stoke up a doke high to the nth degree. That might make it 60 in their apartment. And Kathy had the flu. A rat trotted lazily, lousily across the cracked and blistered cement of the street. Across the way, the ancient and rusted skeleton of a 2013 Humber stood on decayed axles. It had been completely stripped even to the wheel bearings and motor mounts, but the cops didn't take it away. The cops rarely ventured south of the canal anymore. Co-op City stood in a radiating rat warren of parking lots, deserted shops, urban centers, and paved playgrounds. The cycle gang is with the law here, and all those newsy items about the intrepid block police of South City were nothing but a pile of warm crap. The streets were ghostly, silent, if you went out, you took the new mall bus or you carried a gas cylinder. He walked fast, not looking around, not thinking. The air was sulfurous and thick. Four cycles roared past, and someone threw a ragged hunk of asphalt paving. Richards ducked easily. Two new mall buses passed him, buffeting him with air, but he did not flag them. The week's $20 unemployment allotment, old bucks, had been spent. There was no money to buy a token. He supposed the roving 
Pax could sense his poverty, he was not molested. High rises, developments, chain link fences, parking lots empty except for stripped derelicts. Obscenities scrawled on the pavement in soft chalk and now blurring with the rain. Crashed out windows, rats, wet bags of garbage splashed over the sidewalks and into the gutters. Graffiti written jaggedly on crumbling gray walls. Augie, don't let the sun set on you here. Home folks blow dokes. Your mommy itches. Skin your banana. Tommy's pushing. Hitler was cool. Mary. Sid. Kill all kikes. The old GA sodium lights put up in the 70s busted with rocks and hunks of paving. No Technico was going to replace them down here. They were on the new credit dollar. Technico stay uptown, baby. Uptown school. Everything's silent except for the rising, then descending whoosh of the new mo buses and the echoing clack of Richards' footfalls. This battlefield only lights up at night. In the day, it is a deserted gray silence which contains no movement but the cats and rats and fat white maggots trundling across the garbage. No smell but the decaying reek of this brave year 2025. The free V cables are safely buried under the streets and no one but an idiot or a revolutionary would want to vandalize them. Free V is the stuff of dreams, the bread of life. Skag is 12 old bucks a bag. Frisco Push goes for 20 a tad, but the freebie will freak you for nothing. Farther along on the other side of the canal, the dream machine runs 24 hours a day. But it runs on new dollars, and only employed people have any. There are 4 million others, almost all of them unemployed, south of the canal in Co-op City. Richards walked 3 miles, and the occasional liquor stores and smoke shops at first heavily grilled become more numerous. Then the X houses. 24 perversions, count of 24. The hockeries, the blood emporiums. Greasers sitting on cycles at every corner. The gutters buried in snow drifts of roach ends. Rich blokes smoke dopes. He could see the skyscrapers rising into the clouds now, high and clean. The highest of all was the network games building, 100 stories, the top half buried in cloud and smog cover. He fixed his eyes on it and walked another mile. Now the more expensive movie houses and smoke shops with no grills, but red pigs stood outside, the electric move-alongs hanging from their Sam Brown belts. A city cop on every corner. The People's Fountain Park, admission 75 cents. Well-dressed mothers watching their children as they frolicked on the astroturf behind chain-link fencing. A cop on either side of the gate. A tiny, pathetic glimpse of the fountain. He crossed the canal. As he got closer to the games building, it grew taller, more and more improbable with its impersonal tiers of rising office windows, its polished stonework. Cops watching him, ready to hustle him along or bust him if he tried to commit loitering. Uptown, there was only one function for a man in baggy gray pants and a cheap bowl haircut and sunken eyes. That purpose was the games. The qualifying examinations began promptly at noon. And when Ben Richards stepped behind the last man in line, he was almost in the umbra of the games building. But the building was still nine blocks and over a mile away. The line stretched before him like an eternal snake. Soon others joined it behind him. The police watched them, hands on either gun butts or move-alongs. They smiled anonymous, contemptuous smiles. That one looked like a half-wit to you, Frank. Looks like one to me. The guy down there asked me if there was a place where you could go to the bathroom. Can you imagine it? Sons of bitches ain't kill their own mothers. Smelled like you didn't have a bath for... Ain't nothing like a freak show, I always. Heads down against the rain. They shuffled aimlessly. And after a while, the line began to move. Minus 098 and counting. It was after four when Ben Richards got to the main desk and was ready to desk 9QR. The woman sitting at the rumbling plastic punch looked tired and cruel and impersonal. She looked at him and saw no one. Name last first medal. Richards, Benjamin Stewart. Her fingers raced over the keys. Glitter, glitter, glitter went the machine. Age, height, weight. 28, 62, 165. Clear, clear, clear. Certified IQ by Weschler Testing.
if you know it, and age test in 126, age of 14. Clear, clear, clear. The huge lobby was an echoing, rebounding tomb of sound. Questions being asked and answered. People were being led out, weeping. People were being thrown out. Hoarse voices were raised in protest, a scream or two. Questions, always questions. Last school attended, manual trades. Did you graduate? No. How many years and at what age did you leave? Two years, 16 years old. Reasons for leaving? I got married. Clitter, clitter, clitter. Name and age of spouse, if any. Sheila Catherine Richards, 26. Name and ages of children, if any. Catherine Sarah Richards, 18 months. Clear, clear, clear. Last question, mister. Don't bother lying. They'll pick it up during the physical and disqualify you there. Have you ever used heroin or the synthetic amphetamine hallucinogen called San Francisco Bush? No. Clear. A plastic card popped out and she handed it to him. Don't lose this, big fella. If you do, you have to start back at go next week. She was looking at him now, seeing his face, the angry eyes, lanky body. Not bad looking. At least some intelligence and good stance. She took his card back abruptly and punched off the upper right-hand corner, giving it an odd, milled appearance. What was that for? Never mind. Somebody will tell you later, maybe. Jesus fucking... She pointed over his shoulder at a long hall, which led toward a bank of elevators. Dozens of men, fresh from the desks, were being stopped, showing their plastic IDs and moving on. As Richards watched, a trembling, sallow-faced push freak was stopped by a cop and shown the door. The freak began to cry, but he went. Tough old world, big fella, the woman behind the desk said without sympathy. Move along. Richards moved along. Behind him, the litany was already beginning again. Minus 097, and counting. A hard, calloused hand slapped his shoulder at the head of the hall beyond the desks. Card, buddy. Richard showed it. The cop relaxed, his face subtle and Chinese with disappointment. You like turning them back, don't you? Richards asked. It really gives you a charge, doesn't it? You want to go downtown, maggot? Richards walked past him, and the cop made no move. He stopped halfway to the bank of elevators and looked back. Hey, cop. The cop looked at him truculently. Got a family? It could be you next week. Move on, the cop shouted furiously. With a smile, Richards moved on. There was a line of perhaps 20 applicants waiting at the elevators. Richards showed one of the cops on duty his card. She got the witch of the what she did. Oh. Hit the bell with a blot she did. But she fell in love with a hominid. Where is the Richards showed one of the cops on duty his card? And the cop looked at him closely. You a hard ass, sonny? Hard enough, Richard said and smiled. The cop gave him back his card. The kick it soft again. How smart do you talk with holes in your head, sonny? Just about as smart as you talk without that gun on your leg and your pants down around your ankles, Richard said, still smiling. Want to try it? For a moment, he thought the cop was going to swing at him. They'll fix you, the cop said. You'll do some walking on your knees before you're done. The cop swaggered over to three new arrivals and demanded to see their cards. The man ahead of Richard's turned around. He had a nervous, unhappy face and curly hair that came down in a widow's beak. Say, you don't want to antagonize them, fella. They've got a great mind. Is that so? Richards asked, looking at him mildly. The man turned away. Abruptly, the elevator doors snapped open. A black cop with a huge gun stood protecting the bank of push buttons. Another cop sat on a small stool, reading a 3D pervert mag in a small bulletproof cubicle the size of a telephone booth at the rear of the large car. A sawed-off shotgun rested between his knees. Shells were lined up beside him within easy reach. Step to the rear, the fat cop cried with bored importance. Step to the rear, step to the rear. They crowded in to a depth where a deep breath was impossible. Sad flesh walled Richards on every side. They went up to the second floor. The doors snapped open. 
Richards, who stood ahead taller than anyone else in the car, saw a huge waiting room with many chairs dominated by a huge freebie. A cigarette dispenser stood in one corner. Step out, step out, show ID cards to your left. They stepped out, holding out their ID cards to the impersonal lens of a camera. Three cops stood close by. For some reason, a buzzer went off at the side of some dozen cards, and the holders were jerked out of line and hustled away. Richards showed his card and was waved on. He went to the cigarette machine, got a package of blams, and sat down as far from the free V as possible. He lit up a smoke and exhaled, coughing. He hadn't had a cigarette in almost six months. Minus 096 and counting. They called the A's for the physical almost immediately, and about two dozen men got up and filed through a door beyond the freebie. A large sign tacked over the door read, This way. There was an arrow below the legend pointing at the door. The literacy of games applicants was notoriously low. They were taking a new letter every 15 minutes or so. Then Richards had sat down at about five, and so he estimated it would be quarter of nine before they got to him. He wished he had brought a book, but he supposed things were just as well as they were. Books were regarded with suspicion at best, especially when carried by someone from south of the canal. Pervert mags were safer. He watched the six o'clock newsy restlessly. The fighting in Ecuador was worse. New cannibal riots had broken out in India. The Detroit Tigers had taken the Harding Catamounts by a score of 6-2 to two in an afternoon game. And when the first of the evening's big money games came on at 6.30, he went restlessly to the window and looked out. Now that his mind was made up, the games bored him again. Most of the others, however, were watching fun guns with a dreadful fascination. Next week, it might be them. Outside, daylight was bleeding slowly toward dusk. The L's were slamming at high speed through the power rings above the second floor window, their powerful headlights searching the gray air. On the sidewalks below, crowds of men and women, most of them of course technicos or network bureaucrats, were beginning their evening's prowl in search of entertainment. A certified pusher was hawking his wares on the corner across the street. A man with a sable dolly on each arm passed below him. The trio was laughing about something. He had a sudden awful wave of homesickness for Sheila and Kathy, and wished he could call them. He didn't think it was allowed. He could still walk out, of course. Several men already had. They walked across the room, grinning obscurely at nothing, to use the door marked Two Street. Back to the flat, with his daughter glowing fever bright in the other room? No, couldn't, couldn't. He stood at the window a little while longer, then went back and sat down. The new game, Dig Your Grave, was beginning. The fellow sitting next to Richards twitched his arm anxiously. Is it true that they wash out over 30% just on the physicals? I don't know, Richards said. Jesus, the fellow said. I got bronchitis. Maybe treadmill the bucks. Richards could think of nothing to say. The pal's respiration sounded like a faraway truck trying to climb a steep hill. I got a family the man said with soft desperation. Richards looked at the free V as if it interested him. The fellow was quiet for a long time. When the program changed again at 7.30, Richards heard him asking the man on his other side about the physical. It was full dark outside now. Richards wondered if it was still raining. It seemed like a very long evening. Minus 095 and counting. When the R's went through the door under the red arrow and into the examination room, it was just a few minutes after 9.30. A lot of the initial excitement had worn off, and people were either watching the freebie avidly with none of their prior dread, or dozing. The man with the noisy chest had a name that began with L, and had been called over an hour before. Richards wondered idly if he had been cut. The examination room was long and tiled, lit with fluorescent tubes. It looked like an assembly line, with bored doctors standing at various stations along the way. Would any of you like to check my little girl? Richards thought bitterly. The applicants showed their cards to another camera eye embedded in the wall and were ordered to stop by a row of clothes hooks. A doctor in a long white lab coat walked over to them, flipboard tucked under one arm. Strip, he said. Hang your clothes on the hooks. Remember the number over your hook and give the number to the orderly at the far end. Don't worry about...
want your valuables. Nobody here wants them. Valuables. Valuables. That was a hot one, Richards thought, unbuttoning his shirt. He had an empty wallet Eight. with a few pictures of Sheila and Kathy. A receipt for a shoe sole he had had replaced at the local cobbler six months ago. A key ring with no keys on it except for the door key. A baby sock that he did not remember putting in there. And a package of blams he had gotten from the machine. He was wearing tattered skivvies because Sheila was too stubborn to let him go without. But many of the men were buck under their pants. Soon they all stood stripped and anonymous. Penises dangling between their legs like forgotten war clubs. Everyone held his card in one hand. Some shoveled their feet as if the floor were cold, although it was not. The faint, impersonal and nostalgic odor of alcohol drifted through. Stay in line, the doctor with the clipboard was instructing. Always show your card. Follow instructions. The line moved forward. Richard saw there was a cop with each doctor along the way. He dropped his eyes and waited passively. Card. He gave his card over. The first doctor noted the number, then said, Open your mouth. Richards opened it. His tongue was depressed. The next doctor peered into his pupils with a tiny bright light and then stared in his ears. The next placed the cold circle of a stethoscope on his chest. Cough. Richards coughed. Down the line, a man was being hauled away. He needed the money. They couldn't do it. He'd get his lawyer on them. The doctor moved his stethoscope. Cough. Richards coughed. The doctor turned him around and put the stethoscope on his back. Take a deep breath and hold it. The stethoscope moved. Exhale. Richards exhaled. Move along. His blood pressure was taken by a grinning doctor with an eye patch. He was given a short arm inspection by a bald medico who had several large brown freckles like liver spots on his pate. The doctor placed a cool hand between the sack of his scrotum and his upper thigh. Cough. Richards coughed. Move along. His temperature was taken. He was asked to spit in a cup. Halfway now. Halfway down the hall. Two or three men had already finished up, and an orderly with a pasty face and rabbit teeth was bringing them their clothes in wire baskets. Half a dozen more had been pulled out of the line and shown the stairs. Bend over and spread your cheeks. Richards bent and spread. A finger coated with plastic invaded his rectal channel, explored, retreated. Move along. He stepped into a booth with curtains on three sides, like the old voting booths. Voting booths that had been done away with by computer election 11 years ago. And urinated in a blue beaker. The doctor took it and put it in a wire rack. At the next stop, he looked at an eye chart. Read, the doctor said. E, A, L, D, M, F, S, P, M, Z, K, L, A, C, D, U, S, G, A. That's enough. Move along. He entered another pseudo-voting booth and put earphones over his head. He was told to push the white button when he heard something and the red button when he didn't hear it anymore. The sound was very high and faint, like a dog whistle that had been pitch lowered into just audible human range. Richards pushed buttons until he was told to stop. He was weighed. His arches were examined. He stood in front of a fluoroscope and put on a lead apron. A doctor chewing gum and singing something tunelessly under his breath took several pictures and noted his card number. Richards had come in with a group of about 30. Twelve had made it to the far end of the room. Some were dressed and waiting for the elevator. About a dozen more had been hauled out of line. One of them tried to attack the doctor that had cut him and was felled by a policeman wielding a move-along at full charge. The pal fell as if pole-axed. Richards stood at a low table and was asked if he had had some 50 different diseases. Most of them were respiratory in nature. The doctor looked up sharply when Richards said there was a case of influenza in the family. Wife? No, my daughter. Age? A year and a half. Have you been immunized? Don't try to lie. The doctor shouted suddenly, as if Richards had already tried to lie. We'll check your health stats. Immunized July 2023. Booster September 2023. Block Health Clinic. Move along. Richards had a sudden urge to reach over the table and pop the maggot's neck. Instead, he moved along. At the last stop, a severe-looking woman doctor with close-cropped hair and an electric juicer plugged into one ear. 
asked him if he was a homosexual? No. Have you ever been arrested on a felony charge? No. Do you have any severe phobias? By that I mean, no. You better listen to the definition, she said with a faint touch of condescension. I mean, do I have any unusual and compulsive fears such as acrophobia or claustrophobia? I don't. Her lips pressed tightly together, and for a moment she seemed on the verge of sharp comment. Do you use or have you used any hallucinogenic or addictive drugs? No. Do you have any relatives who have been arrested on charges of crimes against the government or against the network? No. Sign this loyalty oath and this Games Commission release form, Mr. Uh, Richards. He scratched his signature. Show the orderly your card and tell him the number. He left her in mid-sentence and gestured at the buck-toothed orderly with his thumb. Number 26, Bugs. Doing this wrong. The orderly brought his things. Richards dressed slowly and went over by the elevator. His anus felt hot and embarrassed, violated, a little slippery with the lubricant the doctor had used. When they were all bunched together, the elevator door opened. The bulletproof Judas hole was empty this time. The cop was a skinny man with a large wind beside his nose. Step to the rear, he chanted. Please step to the rear. As the doors closed, Richards could see the S's coming in at the far end of the hall. The doctor with the clipboard was approaching them. Then the doors clicked together, cutting off the view. They rode up to the third floor, and the doors opened on a huge semi-lit dormitory. Rows and rows of narrow iron and canvas cots seemed to stretch out to infinity. Two cops began to check them out of the elevator, giving them bed numbers. Richards was 940. The cot had one brown blanket and a very flat pillow. Richards lay down on the cot and let his shoes drop to the floor. His feet dangled over the end. There was nothing to be done about it. He crossed his arms under his head and stared at the ceiling. Minus 094 and counting. He is awakened promptly at 6 the following morning by a very loud buzzer. For a moment he was foggy, disoriented, wondering if Sheila had bought an alarm clock or what. Then it came to him, and he sat up. They were led by groups of 50 into a large industrial bathroom where they showed their cards to a camera guarded by a policeman. Richards went to a blue tiled booth that contained a mirror, a basin, a shower, a toilet. On the shelf above the basin was a row of toothbrushes wrapped in cellophane an electric razor, a bar of soap, and a half-used tube of toothpaste. A sign tucked into the corner of the mirror read, Respect this property. Beneath it, someone had scrawled, I only respect my ass. Richards showered, dried with a towel that topped a pile on the toilet tank, shaved and brushed. They were let into a cafeteria where they showed their ID cards again. Richards took a tray and pushed it down a stainless steel ledge. He was given a box of cornflakes, a greasy dish of home fries, a scoop of scrambled eggs, a piece of toast as cold and hard as a marble gravestone, a half pint of milk, a cup of muddy coffee, no cream, an envelope of sugar, an envelope of salt, and a pat of fake butter on a tiny square of oily paper. He wolfed the meal, they all did. For Richards, it was the first real food, other than greasy pizza wedges and government pill commodities, that he had eaten in God knew how long. Yet it was oddly bland, as if some vampire chef in the kitchen had sucked all the taste out of it and left only brute nutrients. What were they eating this morning? Kelp pills, fake milk for the baby. A sudden feeling of desperation swelled over him. Christ, when would they start seeing money? Today? Tomorrow? Next week? Or maybe that was just a gimmick, too, a flashy come-on. Maybe there wasn't even any rainbow, let alone a pot of gold. He sat staring at his empty plate until the 7 o'clock buzzer went, and they were moved on to the elevators. Minus 093 and counting. On the fourth floor, Richards's group of 50 was herded first into a large, furnitureless room, ringed with what looked like letter slots. They showed their cards again, and the elevator doors whooshed closed behind them. A gaunt man with receding hair with the game's emblem, the silhouette of a human head superimposed over a torch, on his lab coat, came into the room. 
Please undress and remove all valuables from your clothes, he said. Then drop your clothes into one of the incinerator slots. You'll be issued games coveralls. He smiled magnanimously. You may keep the coveralls no matter what your personal game's resolution may be. There was some grumbling, but everyone complied. Hurry, please, the gaunt man said. He clapped his hands together twice, like a first grade teacher signaling the end of playtime. We have lots ahead of us. Are you going to be a contestant too? Richards asked. The gaunt man favored him with a puzzled expression. Somebody in the back snickered. Never mind, Richards said and stepped out of his trousers. He removed his unvaluable valuables and dumped his shirt, pants and skivvies into a letter slot. There was a brief hungry flash of flame from somewhere far below. The door at the other end opened. There was always a door at the other end. They were like rats in a huge upward tending maze. An American maze, Richards reflected. And men trundled in large baskets on wheels, labeled S, M, L, and XL. Richards selected an XL for its length and expected it to hang baggily on his frame, but it fit quite well. The material was soft, clingy, almost like silk, but tougher than silk. A single nylon zipper ran up the front. They were all dark blue, and they all had the game's emblem on the right breast pocket. When the entire group was wearing them, Ben Richards felt as if he had lost his face. This way, please, the gaunt man said, and ushered them into another waiting room. The inevitable freebie blared and cackled. You'll be called in groups of ten. The door beyond the freebie was topped by another sign reading, This way, complete with arrow. They sat down. After a while, Richards got up and went to the window and looked out. They were higher up, but it was still raining. The streets were slick and black and wet. He wondered what Sheila was doing. Minus 092 and counting. He went through the door, one of a group of ten now, at quarter past ten. They went through single file. Their cards were scanned. There were ten three-sided booths, but these were more substantial. The sides were constructed of drilled, soundproof cork paneling. The overhead lighting was soft and indirect. Muzak was emanating from hidden speakers. There was a plush carpet on the floor. Richards' feet felt startled by something that wasn't cement. The gaunt man had said something to him. Richards blinked, huh? Booth six, the gaunt man said reprovingly. Oh, he went to booth six. There was a table inside and a large wall clock mounted at eye level beyond it. On the table was a sharpened GA IBM pencil and a pile of unlined paper. Cheap grade, Richards noted. Standing beside all this was a dazzling computer-age priestess, a tall Juno-esque blonde wearing iridescent short shorts, which cleanly outlined the delta-shaped rise of her pudenda. Rouged nipples poked perkily through a silk fishnet blouselet. Sit down, please, she said. I am Rinda Ward, your tester. She held out her hand. Startled, Richards shook it. Benjamin Richards. May I call you Ben? The smile was seductive but impersonal. He felt exactly the token rise of desire he was supposed to feel for this well-stacked female with her well-fed body on display. It angered him. He wondered if she got her kicks this way, showing it off to the poor slobs on their way to the meat grinder. Sure, he said. Nice tits. Thank you, she said, unruffled. He was seated now, looking up while she looked down, and it added an even more embarrassing angle to the picture. This test today is to your mental faculties, what your physical yesterday was to your body. It will be a fairly long test, and your luncheon will be around three this afternoon, assuming you pass. The smile winked on and off. The first section is verbal. You have one hour from the time I give you the test booklet. You may ask questions during the examination, and I will answer them if I am allowed to do so. I will not give you any answers to test questions, however. You understand? Yes. She handed him the booklet. There was a large red hand printed on the cover, palm outward. In large red letters beneath it said, Stop. Beneath this, Do not turn to the first page until your tester instructs you to proceed. Heavy, Richards remarked. 
Pardon me. The perfectly sculpted eyebrows went up a notch. Nothing. You will find an answer sheet when you open your booklet, she recited. Please make your remarks heavy and black. If you wish to change an answer, please erase completely. If you do not know an answer, do not guess. Do you understand? Yes. Then please turn to page one and begin. When I say stop, please put your pencil down. You may begin. He didn't begin. He eyed her body slowly, insolently. After a moment, she flushed. Your hour has begun, Ben. You had better... Why? He asked. Does everybody assume that when they are dealing with someone from south of the canal, they are dealing with a horny, mental incompetent? She was completely flustered now. I... I never... No, you never. He smiled and picked up his pencil. My Christ, you people are dumb. He bent to the test while she was still trying to find an answer, or even a reason, for his attack. She probably really didn't understand. The first section required him to mark the letter of the correct fill-in-the-blank answer. One blank does not make a summer. A thought. B. Beer. C. Swallow. D. Crime. E. None of these. He filled in his answer sheet rapidly, rarely stopping to deliberate or consider an answer twice. Fill-ins were followed by vocabulary, then by word contrasts. When he finished, the hour allotted still had 15 minutes to run. She made him keep his exam. Legally, he couldn't give it to her until the hour was up. So Richards leaned back and wordlessly ogled her nearly naked body. The silence grew thick and oppressive, charged. He could see her wishing for an overcoat, and it pleased him. When the time was up, she gave him a second exam. On the first page, there was a drawing of a gasoline carburetor. Below, you would put this in A, A, lawnmower, B, freebie, C, electric hammock, D, automobile, E, none of these. The third exam was a math diagnostic. He was not so good with figures, and he began to sweat lightly as he saw the clock getting away from him. In the end, it was nearly a dead heat. He didn't get a chance to finish the last question. Brenda Ward smiled a trifle too widely as she pulled the test and answer sheet away from him. Not so fast on that one, Ben. But they'll be all right, he said, and smiled back at her. He leaned forward and swatted her lightly on the rump. Take a shower, kid. You done good. She blushed furiously. I could have you disqualified. Bullshit. You could get yourself fired, that's all. Get out. Get back in line. She was snarling suddenly near tears. He felt something almost like compassion and choked it back. You have a nice night tonight, he said. You go out and have a nice six-course meal with whoever you're sleeping with this week and think about my kid dying of flu in a shitty three-room development apartment. He left her staring after him, white-faced. His group of ten had been cut to six, and they trooped into the next room. It was 1.30. Minus 091 and counting. The doctor, sitting on the other side of the table in the small booth, wore glasses with tiny thick lenses. He had a kind of nasty, pleased grin that reminded Richards of a half-wit he had known as a boy. The kid had enjoyed crouching under the high school bleachers and looking up girls' skirts while he flogged his dog. Richards began to grin. Something pleasant? The doctor asked, flipping up the first ink blot. The nasty grin widened the tiniest bit. Yes, you remind me of someone I used to know. Oh, who? Never mind. Very well. What do you see here? Richards looked at it. An inflated blood pressure cuff had been cinched to his right arm. A number of electrodes had been pasted to his head, and wires from both his head and arm were jacked into a console beside the doctor. Squiggly lines moved across the face of a computer console. Two Negro women kissing. He flipped up another one. This? A sports car looks like a Jag. Do you like gas cars? Richard shrugged. I had a model collection when I was a kid. The doctor made a note and flipped up another car. Sick person. She's lying on her side. The shadows on her face look like prison bars. And this last one? Richards burst out laughing. Looks like a pile of shit. He thought of the doctor, complete with his white coat, running around under the bleachers, looking up girls' skirts and jacking off, and he began to laugh again. The doctor said,
sat smiling his nasty smile, making the vision more real, thus funnier. At last, his giggles tapered off to a snort or two. Richards hiccuped once and was still. I don't suppose you'd care to tell me? No, Richards said, I wouldn't. We'll proceed then. Word association. He didn't bother to explain it. Richards supposed word was getting around. That was good. It would save time. Ready? Yes. The doctor produced a stopwatch from an inside pocket, clicked the business end of his ballpoint pen, and considered a list in front of him. Doctor. Hager. Richards responded. Penis. Cock. Red. Black. Silver. Dagger. Rifle. Murder. Win. Money. Sex. Tests. Strike. Out. The list continued. They went through over 50 words before the doctor clicked the stem of the stopwatch down and dropped his pen. Good, he said. He folded his hands and looked at Richards, seriously. I have a final question, men. I won't say that I'll know a lie when I hear it, but the machine you're hooked up to will give a very strong indication one way or the other. Have you decided to try for qualification status in the games out of any suicidal motivation? No. What is your reason? My little girl's sick. She needs a doctor, medicine, hospital care. The ballpoint scratched. Anything else? Richards was on the verge of saying no, it was none of their business, and then decided he would give it all. Perhaps because the doctor looked like that nearly forgotten, dirty boy of his youth. Maybe only because it needed to be said once, to make it coalesce and take concrete shape, as things do when a man forces himself to translate unformed emotional reactions into spoken words. I haven't had work for a long time. I want to work again, even if it's only being the sucker man in a loaded game. I want to work and support my family. I have pride. Do you have pride, Doctor? It goes before a fall, the doctor said. He clicked the tip of his ballpoint in. If you have nothing to add, Mr. Richards, he stood up. That, and the switch back to his surname, suggested that the interview was over, whether Richards had any more to say or not. No. The door is down the hall to your right. Good luck. <laughs> sure, Richards said. Minus 090 and counting. The group Richards had come in with was now reduced to four. The new waiting room was much smaller, and the whole group had been reduced roughly by the same figure of 60%. The last of the Ys and Zs straggled in at 4.30. At four, an orderly had circulated with a tray of tasteless sandwiches. Richards got two of them and sat munching, listening to a pal named Rettenmund, as he regaled Richards and a few others with a seemingly inexhaustible fund of dirty stories. When the whole group was together, they were shunted into an elevator and lifted to the fifth floor. Their quarters were made up of a large common room, a communal lavatory, and the inevitable sleep factory with its rows of cots. They were informed that a cafeteria down the hall would serve a hot meal at seven o'clock. Richards sat still for a few minutes, then got up and walked over to the cop stationed by the door they had come in through. Is there a telephone, pal? He didn't expect they would be allowed to phone out, but the cop merely jerked his thumb toward the hall. Richards pushed the door open a crack and peered out. Sure enough, there it was. Payphone. He looked at the cop again. Listen, if you loan me 50 cents for the phone, I'll screw off, Jack. Richards held his temper. I want to call my wife. Our kid is sick. Put yourself in my place, for Christ's sake. The cop laughed, a short, chopping, ugly sound. You types are all the same. A story for every day of the year. Technicolor in 3D on Christmas and Mother's Day. You bastard, Richard said. And something in his eyes, the stance of his shoulders, suddenly made the cop shift his gaze to the wall. Aren't you married yourself? Didn't you ever find yourself strapped and have to borrow, even if it tasted like shit in your mouth? The cop suddenly jammed a hand into his jumper pocket and came up with a fistful of plastic coins. He thrust two new quarters at Richards, stuffed the rest of the money back in his pocket, and grabbed a handful of Richards' tunic. If 
you send anybody else over here because Charlie Grady is a soft touch, I'll beat your son of a bitching brains out, maggot. Thank you, Richard said steadily. For the loan. Charlie Grady laughed and let him go. Richards went out into the hall, picked up the phone, and dropped his money into the horn. It banged hollowly, and for a moment nothing happened. Oh, Jesus, all for nothing. But then the dial tone came. He punched the number of the fifth floor hall phone slowly, hoping the Jenner bitch down the hall wouldn't answer. She'd just as soon yell wrong number when she recognized his voice and he would lose his money. It rang six times. And then an unfamiliar voice said, Hello? I want to talk to Sheila Richards in 5C. I think she went out, the voice said. It grew insinuating. She walks up and down the block, you know. They got a sick kid. The man there is shiftless. Just knock on the door, he said cotton-mouthed. Hold on. The phone on the other end crashed against the wall as the unfamiliar voice let it dangle. Far away, dim as if in a dream, he heard the unfamiliar voice knocking and yelling. Phone! Phone for you, Mrs. Richards! Half a minute later, the unfamiliar voice was back on the line. She ain't there. I can hear the kid yelling, but she ain't there. Like I say, she keeps an eye out when the fleet's in. The voice giggled. Richards wished he could teleport himself through the phone line and pop out on the other end like an evil genie from a black bottle and choke the unfamiliar voice until his eyeballs popped out and rolled on the floor. Take a message, he said. Write it on the wall if you have to. Ain't got no pencil. I'm hanging up. Goodbye. Wait, Richards yelled, panic in his voice. I'm... Just a second. Grudgingly, the voice said, She coming up the stairs now. Sweat lay against the wall. Quizzical, wary, a little frightened. Hello? Sheila. He closed his eyes, letting the wall support him. Ben. Yeah, fine. Kept it the same. The fever isn't so bad, but she sounds so croupy. Ben, I think there's water in her lungs. What if she has pneumonia? It'll be all right. It'll be all right. I... She paused, a long pause. I hate to leave her, but I had to. Ben, I turned two tricks this morning. I'm sorry, but I got her some medicine at the drug. Some good medicine. Her voice had taken on a zealous evangelical lilt. That stuff is shit, he said. Listen, no more, Sheila. Please. I think I'm in here, really. They can't cut many more guys because there's too many shows. There's got to be enough cannon fodder to go around. And they give advances, I think. Mrs. Upshaw. She looked awful in black. Sheila broke in tonelessly. Never mind that. You stay with Kathy, Sheila. No more tricks. All right. I won't go out again. But he didn't believe her voice. Fingers crossed, Sheila. I love you, Ben. And I love... Three minutes are up, the operator broke in. If you wish to continue, please deposit one new quarter or three old quarters. Wait a second, Richards yelled. Get off the goddamn line, bitch, you... The empty hum of a broken connection. He threw the receiver. It flew the length of its silver cord, then rebounded, striking the wall, and then penduluming slowly back and forth like some strange snake that had bitten once and then died. Some way as he walked back. Somebody has to. Minus 08 ordered on the fifth floor until 10 o'clock the following day. And Richards was nearly out of his mind with anger, worry, and frustration when a young and slightly faggoty-looking pal and a skitter. They were perhaps 300 in all. Over 60 of their number had been removed soundlessly and painlessly the night before. One of them had been the kid with an inexhaustible fund of dirty jokes. They were taken to a small auditorium on the sixth floor in groups of 50. The auditorium was very luxurious, done in great quantities of red plush. There was an ashtray built into the real wood arm of every seat, and Richards hauled out his crumpled pack of blams. He tapped his ashes on the floor. There was a small stage at the front, and in the center of that, a lectern. A pitcher of water stood on it. At about 15 minutes past 10, the faggoty-looking fellow walked to the lectern and said, I'd like you to meet Arthur M. Burns, assistant director of games. Who's uh, Somebody behind Richard said in a sour voice. A portly man 
with a tonsure surrounded by gray hair, strode to the lectern, pausing and cocking his head as he arrived, as if to appreciate a round of applause which only he could hear. Then he smiled at them, a broad, twinkling smile that seemed to transform him into a pudgy, aging Cupid in a business suit. Congratulations, he said. You've made it. There was a huge collective sigh, followed by some laughter and backslapping. More cigarettes were lit up. Huzzah, the sour voice repeated. Shortly, your program assignments and seventh floor room numbers will be passed out. The executive producers of your particular programs will explain further exactly what is expected of you. But before that happens, I just want to repeat my congratulations and tell you that I find you to be a courageous, resourceful group. Refusing to live on the public dole when you have means at your disposal to acquit yourselves as men, and may I add personally, as true heroes of our time. Bullshit, the sour voice remarked. Furthermore, I speak for the entire network when I wish you good luck and Godspeed. Arthur M. Burns chuckled porkily and rubbed his hands together. Well, I know you're anxious to get those assignments, so I'll spare you any more of my jabber. A side door popped open, and a dozen games ushers wearing red tunics came into the auditorium. They began to call out names. White envelopes were passed out, and soon they littered the floor like confetti. Plastic assignment cards were read, exchanged with new acquaintances. There were muffled groans, cheers, catcalls. Arthur M. Burns presided over it all from his podium, smiling benevolently. <laughs> that Christly, how hot can you take it? Jesus, I hate the heat. The show's a goddamn too bitter. Comes on right after the flick tunes, for God's sake. Treadmill to bucks. Gosh, I didn't know my heart was... I was hoping I'd get it, but I didn't really think... Hey, Jake, you ever seen this swim the crocodiles? I thought... Nothing like I expected. I don't think you can... Miserable goddamn. This run for your guns. Benjamin Richards? Ben Richards? Here. He was handed a plain white envelope and tore it open. His fingers were shaking slightly, and it took him two tries to get the small plastic card out. He frowned down at it, not understanding. No program assignment was punched on it. The card read simply, Elevator 6. He put the card in his breast pocket with his ID and left the auditorium. The first five elevators at the end of the hall were doing a brisk business as they ferried the following week's contestants up to the seventh floor. There were four others standing by the closed doors of Elevator 6, and Richards recognized one of them as the owner of the sour voice. What's this? Richards asked. Are we getting the gate? The man with the sour voice was about 25, not bad looking. One arm was withered, probably by polio, which had come back strong in 2005. It had done especially well in co-op. No such luck, he said, and laughed emptily. I think we're getting the big money assignments. The ones where they do more than just land you in the hospital with a stroke or put on an eye or cut off an arm or two. The ones where they kill you. Prime time, baby. They were joined by a sixth pal, a good-looking kid who was blinking at everything in a surprised way. Hello, sucker, the man with the sour voice said. At 11 o'clock, after all the others had been taken away, the doors of elevator six popped open. There was a cop riding in the Judas hole again. See, the man with the sour voice said, we're dangerous characters, public enemies. They're gonna rub us out. He made a tough gangster face and sprayed the bulletproof compartment with an imaginary Sten gun. The cop stared at him woodenly. Minus 088 and counting. The waiting room on the eighth floor was very small, very plush, very intimate, very private. Richards had it all to himself. At the end of the elevator ride, three of them had been promptly whisked away down a plushly carpeted corridor by three cops. Richards, the man with the sour voice, and the kid who blinked a lot, had been taken here. A receptionist who vaguely reminded Richards of one of the old TV sex stars, Liz Kelly, Grace Taylor, he had watched as a kid, smiled at the three of them when they came in. She was sitting at a desk in an alcove, surrounded by so many potted plants that she might have been in an Ecuadorian foxhole. 
Mr. Jansky, she said with a blinding smile. Go right in. The kid who blinked a lot went into the inner sanctum. Richards and the man with the sour voice, whose name was Jimmy Laughlin, made wary conversation. Richards discovered that Laughlin lived only three blocks away from him, on Dock Street. He had held a part-time job until the year before as an engine wiper for General Atomics, and had then been fired for taking part in a sit-down strike protesting leaky radiation shields. Well, I'm alive anyway, he said. According to those maggots, that's all that counts. I'm sterile, of course. That don't matter. That's one of the little risks you run for the princely sum of seven new bucks a day. When G.A. had shown him the door, the withered arm had made it even tougher to get a job. His wife had come down with bad asthma two years before, was now bedridden. Finally, I decided to go for the big brass ring, Laughlin said with a bitter smile. Maybe I'll get a chance to push a few creeps on a high window before McCombs' boys get me. Do you think it really is? The running man? Bet your sweet ass. Give me one of those cruddy cigarettes, pal. Richards gave him one. The door opened and the kid who blinked a lot came out on the arm of a beautiful dolly wearing two handkerchiefs and a prayer. The kid gave them a small nervous smile as they went by. Mr. Laughlin, would you go in, please? So Richards was alone, unless you counted the receptionist who had disappeared into her foxhole again. He got up and went over to the free cigarette machine in the corner. Laughlin must be right, he reflected. The cigarette machine dispensed dokes. They must have hit the big leaks. He got a package of blams, sat down, and lit one up. About 20 minutes later, Laughlin came out with an ash blonde on his arm. A friend of mine from the carpool, he said to Richards and pointed at the blonde. She dimpled beautifully. Laughlin looked pained. At least the bastard talked straight, he said to Richards. See you. He went out. The receptionist poked her head out of the foxhole. Mr. Richards, would you step in, please? He went in. Minus 087 and counting. The inner office looked big enough to play kill ball in. It was dominated by a huge one-wall picture window that looked west over the homes of the middle class, the dockside warehouses and oil tanks, and Harding Lake itself. Both sky and water were pearl gray. It was still raining. A large tanker far out was chugging from right to left. The man behind the desk was of middle height and very black. So black, in fact, that for a moment Richards was struck with unreality. He might have stepped out of a minstrel show. Mr. Richards... He rose and extended his hand over the desk. But Richards did not shake it. He did not seem particularly flustered. He merely took his hand back to himself and sat down. A sling chair was next to the desk. Richards sat down and butted his smoke in an ashtray with a games emblem embossed on it. I'm done killing, Mr. Richards. By now, you've probably guessed why you've been brought here. Our records and your test scores both say you're a bright boy. Richards folded his hands and waited. You've been slated as a contestant on The Running Man, Mr. Richards. It's our biggest show. It's the most lucrative and dangerous for the men involved. I've got your final consent form here on my desk. I've no doubt that you'll sign it, but first I want to tell you why you've been selected, and I want you to understand fully what you're getting into. Richards said nothing. Killian pulled a dossier onto the virgin surface of his desk blotter. Richard saw that it had his name typed on the front. Killian flipped it open. Benjamin Stewart Richards, age 28, born August 8, 1997, City of Harding. Attended South City Manual Trades from September of 2011 until December of 2013. Suspended twice for failure to respect authority. I believe you kicked the assistant principal in the upper thigh once while his back was turned. Crap, Richard said. I kicked him in the ass. Killian nodded. However you say, Mr. Richards. You married Sheila Richards, nay Gordon, at the age of 16. Old style lifetime contract. Rebel all the way, huh? No union affiliation due to your refusal to sign the union oath, the field day, and the wage control articles. I believe that you referred to area governor Johnsbury as a corn-holing son of a bitch. Yes, Richard said. Your work record has been spotty and you've been fired. Let's see. Total of six times for such things as insubordination, insulting superiors, and a 
abusive criticism of authority. Richard shrugged. In short, you are regarded as anti-authoritarian and anti-social. You're a deviant who has been intelligent enough to stay out of prison in serious trouble with the government, and you're not hooked on anything. A staff psychologist reports you saw lesbians, excrement, and a polluted gas vehicle in various ink blots. He also reports a high, unexplained degree of hilarity. He reminded me of a kid I used to know. He liked to hide under the bleachers at school and whack off. The kid, I mean. I don't know what your doctor likes to do. I see. Killian smiled briefly, white teeth glittering in all that darkness, and went back to his folder. You held racial responses outlawed by the Racial Act of 2004. You made several rather violent responses during the word association test. I'm here on violent business, Richard said. To be sure. And yet we... And here I speak in a larger sense than the games authority. I speak in the national sense. View these responses with extreme disquiet. Afraid someone might tape a stick of Irish to your ignition system somewhere? Richards asked, grinning. Killian wet his thumb reflectively and turned to the next sheet. Fortunately, for us, you've given a hostage to fortune, Mr. Richards. You have a daughter named Catherine, 18 months. Was that a mistake? He smiled frostily. Planned, Richard said without rancor. I was working for GA then. Somehow, some of my sperm lived through it. A jest of God, maybe. With the world the way it is, I sometimes think we must have been off our trolley. At any rate, you're here, Killian said, continuing to smile his cold smile. And next Tuesday, you will appear on The Running Man. You've seen the program? Yes. Then you know it's the biggest thing going on Freebie. It's filled with chances for viewer participation, both vicarious and actual. I am executive producer of the program. That's really wonderful, Richard said. The program is one of the surest ways the network has of getting rid of embryo troublemakers such as yourself, Mr. Richards. We've been on for six years. To date, we have no survivals. To be brutally honest, we expect to have none. Then you're running a crooked table, Richards said flatly. Killian seemed more amused than horrified. But we're not. You keep forgetting you're an anachronism, Mr. Richards. People won't be in the bars and hotels or gathering in the cold in front of appliance stores rooting for you to get away. Goodness, no. They want to see you wiped out. And they'll help if they can. The more messy, the better. And there is McCone to contend with. Evan McCone and the Hunters. They sound like a neo-group, Richard said. McCone never loses, Killian said. Richard grunted. You'll appear live Tuesday night. Subsequent programs will be a patch-up of tapes, films, and live tricasts when possible. We've been known to interrupt scheduled broadcasting when a particularly resourceful contestant is on the verge of reaching his personal waterloo, shall we say. The rules are simplicity themselves. You or your surviving family will win 100 new dollars. Will win 100 new dollars for each hour you remain free. We stake you to $4,800 running money on the assumption that you will be able to fox the hunters for 48 hours. The unspent balance refundable, of course, if you fall before the 48 hours are up. You're given a 12-hour head start. If you last 30 days, you'll win the grand prize. One billion new dollars. Richards threw back his head and laughed. My sentiments exactly, Killian said with a dry smile. Do you have any questions? Just one, Richard said, leaning forward. The traces of humor had vanished from his face completely. How would you like to be the one out there on the run? Killian laughed. He held his belly and huge mahogany laughter rolled richly in the room. Oh, Mr. Richards, you must excuse me. And he went off into another gale. At last, dabbing his eyes with a large white handkerchief, Killian seemed to get himself under control. You see, not only are you possessed of a sense of humor, Mr. Richards, you... I... He choked new laughter down. Please excuse me, you've struck my funny bone. I see I have. Other questions? No. Very good. There will be a staff meeting before the program. If any 
any questions should develop in that fascinating mind of yours, please hold them until then. Killian pressed a button on his desk. Spare me the cheap snatch, Richard said. I'm married. Killian's eyebrows went up. Are you quite sure? Fidelity is admirable, Mr. Richards, but it's a long time from Friday to Tuesday. And considering the fact that you may never see your wife again, I'm married. Very well. He nodded to the girl in the doorway and she disappeared. Anything we can do for you, Mr. Richards? You'll have a private suite on the ninth floor, and meal requests will be filled within reason. A good bottle of bourbon, and a telephone so I can talk to my wife. Ah, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Richards. The bourbon we can do. But once you sign this release form, he pushed it over to Richards along with a pen. You're incommunicado until Tuesday. Would you care to reconsider the girl? No, Richard said, and scrawled his name on the dotted line. But you better make that two bottles of bourbon. Certainly. Killian stood and offered his hand again. Richards disregarded it again and walked out. Killian looked after him, and with blank eyes. He was not smiling. Minus 086 and counting. The receptionist popped promptly out of her foxhole as Richards walked through and handed him an envelope on the front. Mr. Richards, I suspect one of the things that you will not mention during our interview is the fact that you need money badly right now. Is it not true? Despite rumors to the contrary, Games Authority does not give advances. You must not look upon yourself as a contestant with all the glitter that word entails. You are not a freebie star, but only a working Joe who is being paid extremely well for undertaking a dangerous job. However, Games Authority has no rule which forbids me from extending you a personal loan. Inside, you will find 10% of your advance salary. Not in new dollars, I should caution you, but in Games Certificates, redeemable for dollars. Should you decide to send these certificates to your wife, as I suspect you will, she will find they have one advantage over new dollars. A reputable doctor will accept them as legal tender, while a quack will not. Sincerely, Dan Killian. Richards opened the envelope and pulled out a thick book of coupons with the game symbol on the vellum cover. Inside were 48 coupons with a face value of 10 new dollars each. Richards felt an absurd wave of gratitude toward Killian sweep him and crushed it. He had no doubt that Killian would attach $480 of his advance money. And besides that, $480 was a pretty goddamn cheap price to pay for insurance on the big show, the continued happiness of the client, and Killian's own big money job. Shit, he said. The receptionist poked attentively out of her foxhole. Did you say something, Mr. Richards? No. Which way to the elevators? Minus 085 and counting. The suite was sumptuous. Wall-to-wall carpeting, almost deep enough to breaststroke in, covered the floors of all three rooms, living room, bedroom, and bath. The free V was turned off. Blessed silence prevailed. There were flowers in the vases, and on the wall next to the door was a button discreetly marked, Service. The service would be fast, too, Richards thought cynically. There were two cops stationed outside his ninth floor suite just to make sure he didn't go wandering. He pushed the service button and the door opened. Yes, Mr. Richards, one of the cops said. Richards fancied he could see how sour that mister tasted in his mouth. The bourbon you asked for will be... It's not that, Richards said. He showed the cop the book of coupons Killian had left for him. I want you to take this somewhere. Just write the name and address, Mr. Richards, and I'll see that it's delivered. Richards found the cobbler's receipt and wrote his address and Sheila's name on the back of it. He gave the tattered paper and the coupon book to the cop. He was turning away when a new thought struck Richards. Hey, just a second. The cop turned back, and Richards plucked the coupon book out of his hand. He opened it to the first coupon and tore one-tenth of it along the perforated line. Equivalent value... One new dollar. Do you know a cop named Charlie Grady? Charlie? The cop looked at him warily. Yeah, I know Charlie. He's got fifth floor duty. Give him this. Richards handed him the coupon.
uniform section. Tell him the extra 50 cents is his usurer's fee. The cop turned away again, and Richards called him back once more. You'll bring me written receipts from my wife and from Grady, won't you? Disgust showed openly on the cop's face. Ain't you the trusting soul? Sure, Richard said, smiling thinly. You guys taught me that. South of the canal, you taught me all about it. It's gonna be fun, the cop said, watching them go after you. I'm gonna be glued to my freebie with a beer in each hand. Just bring me the receipts, Richard said, and closed the door gently in the cop's face. The bourbon came 20 minutes later. And Richards told the surprised delivery man that he would like a couple of thick novels sent up. Novels? Books, you know, read, words, movable press. Richard pantomimed, flipping pages. Yes, sir, he said doubtfully. Do you have a dinner order? Christ, the shit was getting thick. He was drowning in it. Richard saw a sudden fantasy cartoon. Man falls into outhouse hole and drowns in pink shit that smells like Chanel number no. five. The kicker, it still tastes like shit. Steak, peas, mashed potatoes. God, what was Sheila sitting down to? A protein pill and a cup of fake coffee? Milk, apple cobbler with cream. Got it? Yes, sir, would you like? No, Richard said, suddenly distraught. No, get out. He had no appetite. Absolutely none. Minus 084 and counting. With sour amusement, Richards thought that the game's bellboy had taken him literally about the novels. He must have picked them out with a ruler as his only guide. Anything over an inch and a half is okay. He had brought Richards three books he had never heard of. Two golden oldies titled God is an Englishman and Not as a Stranger and a huge tome written three years ago called The Pleasure of Serving. Richard peeked into that one first and wrinkled his nose. Poor boy makes good in general atomics, rises from engine wiper to gear tradesman, takes night courses on what, Richards wondered, monopoly money. Falls in love with beautiful girl, apparently syphilis hadn't rotted her nose off yet, had a block orgy, promoted a junior technico following dazzling aptitude scores, Three-year marriage contract follows, and Richards threw the book across the room. God is an Englishman was a little better. He poured himself a bourbon on the rocks and settled into the story. By the time the discreet knock came, he was 300 pages in, and pretty well in the bag to boot, one of the bourbon bottles was empty. He went to the door, holding the other in his hand. The cop was there. Your receipts, Mr. Richards, he said, and pulled the door closed. Sheila had not written anything, but had sent one of Kathy's baby pictures. He looked at it and felt the easy tears of drunkenness prick his eyes. He put it in his pocket and looked at the other receipt. Charlie Grady had written briefly on the back of a traffic ticket form. Thanks, maggot. Get stuffed, Charlie Grady. Richard snickered and let the paper flitter to the carpet. Thanks, Charlie, he said to the empty room. I needed that. He looked at the picture of Kathy again, a tiny red-faced infant of four days at the time of the photo, screaming her head off, swimming in a white cradle dress that Sheila had made herself. He felt the tears lurking, and made himself think of good old Charlie's thank you note. He wondered if he could kill the entire second bottle before he passed out, and decided to find out. He almost made it. Minus 083 and counting. Richard spent Saturday living through a huge hangover. He was almost over it by Saturday evening and ordered two more bottles of bourbon with supper. He got through both of them and woke up in the pale early light of Sunday morning, seeing large caterpillars with flat murderous eyes crawling slowly down the far bedroom wall. He decided then it would be against his best interests to wreck his reactions completely before Tuesday and laid off the booze. This hangover was slower dissipating. He threw up a good deal, and when there was nothing left to throw up, he had dry heaves. These tapered off around six o'clock Sunday evening, and he ordered soup for dinner, no bourbon. He asked for a dozen neo-rock discers to play on the sweet sound system, and tired of them quickly. He went to bed early, and 
and slept poorly. He spent most of Monday on the tiny glassed-in terrace that opened off the bedroom. He was very high above the waterfront now, and the day was a series of sun and showers that was fairly pleasant. He read two novels, went to bed early again, and slept a little better. There was an unpleasant dream. Sheila was dead and he was at her funeral. Somebody had propped her up in her coffin and stuffed a grotesque corsage of new dollars in her mouth. He tried to run to her and remove the obscenity. Hands grabbed him from behind. He was being held by a dozen cops. One of them was Charlie Grady. He was grinning and saying, This is what happens to losers, maggot. They were putting their pistols to his head when he woke up. Tuesday, he said to no one at all, and rolled out of bed. The fashionable GA sunburst clock on the far wall said it was nine minutes after seven. The live TriCast of the Running Man would be going out all over North America in less than 11 hours. He felt a hot drop of fear in his stomach. In 23 hours, he would be fair game. He had a long hot shower, dressed in his coverall, ordered ham and eggs for breakfast. He also got the bellboy on duty to set up a carton of plans. He spent the rest of the morning and early afternoon reading quietly. It was two o'clock on the nose when a single formal rap came at the door. Three police and Arthur M. Burns, looking potty and more than a bit ridiculous in a games singlet, walked in. All of the cops were carrying move-alongs. It's time for your final briefing, Mr. Richards, Burns said. Would you? Sure, Richards said. He marked his place in the book he had been reading and put it down on the coffee table. He was suddenly terrified, close to panic, and he was very glad there was no perceptible shake in his fingers. Minus 082 and counting. The tenth floor of the games building was a great deal different from the ones below, and Richards knew that he was meant to go no higher. The fiction of upward mobility, which started in the grimy street-level lobby, ended here on the tenth floor. This was the broadcast facility. The hallways were wide, white, and stark. Bright yellow go-karts, powered by GA solar cell motors, pottered here and there, carrying loads of free V technicos to studios and control rooms. A cart was waiting for them when the elevator stopped, and the five of them, Richards, Burns, and Cops, climbed aboard. Necks craned, and Richards was pointed out several times as they made the trip. One woman in a yellow games shorts and holder outfit winked and blew Richards a kiss. He gave her the finger. They seemed to travel miles through dozens of interconnecting corridors. Richards caught glimpses into at least a dozen studios, one of them containing the infamous treadmill seen on Treadmill to Bucks. A tour group from uptown was trying it out and giggling. At last, they came to a stop before a door which read, The Running Man, Absolutely No Admittance. Burns waved to the guard in the bulletproof booth beside the door, and then looked at Richards. Put your ID in the slot between the guard booth and the door, Burns said. Richards did it. His card disappeared into the slot, and a small light went on in the guard booth. The guard pushed a button, and the door slid open. Richards got back into the cart, and they were trundled into the room beyond. Where's my card? Richards asked. You don't need it anymore. They were in a control room. The console section was empty except for a bald technico who was sitting in front of a blank monitor screen reading numbers into a microphone. Across to the left, Dan Killian and two men Richards hadn't met were sitting around a table with frosted glasses. One of them was vaguely familiar, too pretty to be a technico. Hello, Mr. Richards. Hello, Arthur. Would you care for a soft drink, Mr. Richards? Richards found he was thirsty. It was quite warm on 10, in spite of the many air conditioning units he had seen. I'll have a Rudy too, he said. Killian rose, went to a cold cabinet, and snapped the lid from a plastic squeeze bottle. Richards sat down and took the bottle with a nod. Mr. Richards, this gentleman on my right is Fred Victor, the director of The Running Man. This other fellow, as I'm sure you know, is Bobby Thompson. Thompson, of course. Host and MC of The Running Man. He wore a natty green tunic, slightly iridescent, and sported a mane of hair that was silvery attractive enough to be suspect. Do you diet? Richards asked. Thompson's impeccable eyebrows went up. I beg pardon? Never mind, Richards said. You'll have to make allowances.
was for Mr. Richards, Killian said, smiling. He seems afflicted with an extreme case of the roads. Quite understandable, Thompson said, and lit a cigarette. Richards felt a wave of unreality surge over him. Under the circumstances... Come over here, Mr. Richards, if you please, Victor said, taking charge. He led Richards to the bank of screens on the other side of the room. The Technico had finished with his numbers and had left the room. Victor punched two buttons, and left-right views of the running man set sprang into view. We don't do a run-through here, Victor said. We think it detracts from spontaneity. Bobby just wings it, and he does a pretty damn good job. We go on at 6 o'clock, Harding time. Bobby is in center stage on that raised blue dais. He does the lead-in, giving a rundown on you. The monitor will flash a couple of still pictures. You'll be in the wings at stage right, flanked by two games guards. They'll come on with you, armed with riot guns. Move-alongs would be more practical if you decided to give trouble, but the riot guns are good theater. Sure, Richard said. There will be a lot of booing from the audience. We pack it that way because it's good theater, just like the kill ball matches. Are they going to shoot me with fake bullets? Richards asked. You could put a few blood bags on me to spatter on cue. That would be good theater, too. Pay attention, please, Victor said. You and the guards go on when your name is called. Bobby will uh, interview you. Feel free to express yourself as colorfully as you please. It's all a good theater. Then around 6.10, just before the first network promo, you'll be given your stake money and exit, sans guards, at stage left. You understand? Yes, what about Laughlin? Victor frowned and lit a cigarette. He comes on after you at 6.15. We run two contests simultaneously because often one of the contestants is uh, inadept at staying ahead of the hunters. With the kid as a backup? Mr. Jansky? Yes, but none of this concerns you, Mr. Richards. When you exit stage left, you'll be given a tape machine, which is about the size of a box of popcorn. It weighs six pounds. With it, you'll be given 60 tape clips, which are about four inches long. The equipment will fit inside a coat pocket without a bulge. It's a triumph of modern technology. Swell. Victor pressed his lips together. As Dan has already told you, Richards, you're a contestant only for the masses. Actually, you are a working man, and you should view your role in that light. The tape cartridges can be dropped into any mail slot, and they will be delivered express to us so we can edit them for airing that night. Failure to deposit two clips per day will result in legal default of payment. But I'll still be hunted down. Right, so mail those tapes. They won't give away your location. The hunters operate independently of the broadcasting section. Richards had his doubts about that, but said nothing. After we give you the equipment, you will be escorted to the street elevator. This gives directly on Rampart Street. Once you're there, you're on your own. He paused. Questions? No. Then Mr. Killian has one more money detail to straighten out with you. They walked back to where Dan Killian was in conversation with Arthur M. Burns. Richards asked for another Rudy Toot and got it. Mr. Richards, Killian said, twinkling his teeth at him. As you know, you leave the studio unarmed, but this is not to say you cannot arm yourself by fair means or foul. Goodness, no. You or your estate will be paid an additional $100 for any hunter or representative of the law you should happen to dispatch. I know, don't tell me, Richard said. It's good theater. Killian smiled delightedly. How very astute of you. Yes. However, try not to bag any innocent bystanders. That's not kosher. Richard said nothing. The other aspect of the program, the stoolies and independent cameramen, I know. They're not stoolies, they're good North American citizens. It was difficult to tell whether Killian's tone of hurt was real or ironic. Anyway, there's an 800 number for anyone who spots you. A verified sighting pays 100 new dollars. A sighting which results in a kill pays a thousand. We pay independent cameramen $10 a foot and up. Retired a scenic Jamaica on blood money. Richards cried, spreading his arms wide. Get your picture on a hundred 3D weeklies. Be the idol of millions. Just holograph for details. That's enough, Killian said quietly. Bobby Thompson was buffing his fingernails. Victor had wandered out and could be faintly heard yelling at someone about camera angles. Killian pressed a button. Miss Jones, ready for you, sweets. He stood up and offered his hand again. 
Make up next, Mr. Richards, then the lighting runs. You'll be quartered off stage and we won't meet again before you go on, so... It's been grand, Richards said. He declined the hand. Miss Jones let him out. It was 2.30. Oh, okay. I don't know why that stopped, but whatever. Uh, let's keep going. Minus 081 and counting. Richard stood in the wings with a cop on each side, listening to the studio audience as they frantically applauded Bobby Thompson. He was nervous. He jeered at himself for it, but the nervousness was a fact. Cheering would not make it go away. It was 6.01. Tonight's first contestant is a shrewd, resourceful man from south of the canal in our own home city, Thompson was saying. The monitor faded to a stark portrait of Richards in his baggy gray work shirt, taken by a hidden camera days before. The background looked like the fifth floor waiting room. It had been retouched, Richards thought, to make his eyes deeper, his forehead a little lower, his cheeks more shadowed. His mouth had been given a jeering, curled expression by some Technico's airbrush. All in all, the Richards on the monitor was terrifying. The angel of urban death. Brutal, not very bright, but possessed of a certain primitive animal cunning. The uptown apartment dweller's boogeyman. This man is Benjamin Richards, age 28. Know the face well. In a half hour, this man will be on the prowl. A verified sighting brings you 100 new dollars. A sighting which results in a kill results in 1,000 new dollars for you. Richards's mind was wandering. It came back to the point with a mighty slap. And this is the woman that Benjamin Richards' award will go to if and when he is brought down. The picture dissolved to a still of Sheila, but the airbrush had been at work again, this time wielded with a heavier hand. The results were brutal. The sweet, not-so-good-looking face had been transformed into that of a vapid slatter. Full pouting lips, eyes that seemed to glitter with avarice, a suggestion of a double chin fading down to what appeared to be bare breasts. You bastard, Richards grated. He lunged forward, but powerful arms held him back. Simmer down, buddy, it's only a picture. A moment later, he was half led, half dragged on stage. The audience reaction was immediate. The studio was filled with screamed cries of, Boo! Cycle bomb! Get out, you creep! Kill him! Kill the bastard! You eat it! Get out! Get out! Bobby Thompson held his arms up and shouted good-naturedly for quiet. Let's hear what he's got to say. The audience quieted, but reluctantly. Richard stood bull-like under the hot lights with his head lowered. He knew he was projecting exactly the aura of hate and defiance that they wanted him to project, but he could not help it. He stared at Thompson with hard, red-rimmed eyes. Somebody is going to eat their own balls for that picture of my wife, he said. Speak up, speak up, Mr. Richards. Thompson cried with just the right note of contempt. Nobody will hurt you, at least not yet. More screams and hysterical vituperation from the audience. Richards suddenly wheeled to face them, and they quieted as if slapped. Women stared at him with frightened, half-sexual expressions. Men grinned up at him with blood hate in their eyes. You bastards, he cried. If you want to see somebody die so bad, why don't you kill each other? His final words were drowned in more screams. People from the audience, perhaps paid to do so, were trying to get on stage. The police were holding them back. Richards faced them, knowing how he must look. Thank you, Mr. Richards, for those words of wisdom. The contempt was palpable now, and the crowd, nearly silent again, was eating it up. Would you like to tell our audience in the studio and at home how long you think you can hold out? I want to tell everybody in the studio and at home that that wasn't my wife. That was a cheap fake. The crowd drowned him out. Their screams of hate had reached a near fever pitch. Thompson waited nearly a minute for them to quiet a little, and then repeated, How long do you expect to hold out, Mr. Richards? I expect to go the whole 30, Richards said coolly. I don't think you've got anybody who can take me. More screaming, shaken fists. Someone threw a tomato. Bobby Thompson faced the audience again and cried, With those last cheap words of bravado, Mr. Richards will be led from our stage. Tomorrow at noon, the hunt begins. Remember his face. 
It may be next to you on a pneumo bus, in a jet plane, at a 3D rack, in your local Killball Arena. Tonight he's in Harding. Tomorrow in New York, Boise, Albuquerque, Columbus, skulking outside your home. Will you report him? Yes, they screamed. Richard suddenly gave them the finger, both fingers. This time the rush for the stage was by no stretch of the imagination simulated. Richards was rushed out the stage left exit before they could rip him apart on camera, thus depriving the network of all the juicy upcoming coverage. Minus 080 and counting. Killian was in the wings and convulsed with amusement. Fine performance, Mr. Richards. Fine. God, I wish I could give you a bonus. Those fingers. Superb. We aim to please, Richards said. The monitors were dissolving to a promo. Give me the goddamn camera and go fuck yourself. That's generically impossible, Killian said, still grinning. But here's the camera. He took it from the Technico who had been cradling it. Fully loaded and ready to go. And here are the clips. He handed Richards a small, surprisingly heavy oblong box wrapped in oilcloth. Richards dropped the camera into one coat pocket, the clips into the other. Okay, where's the elevator? Not so fast, Killian said. You've got a minute, 12 of them, actually. Your 12 hours leeway doesn't start officially until 6.30. The screams of rage had begun again. Looking over his shoulder, Richard saw that Laughlin was on. His heart went out to him. I like you, Richards, and I think you'll do well, Killian said. You have a certain crude style that I enjoy immensely. I'm a collector, you know. Cave art and Egyptian artifacts are my areas of specialization. You are more analogous to the cave art than to my Egyptian urns, but no matter. I wish you could be preserved, collected if you please, just as my Asian cave paintings have been collected and preserved. Grab a recording of my brainwaves, you bastard, they're on record. So I'd like to give you a piece of advice, Killian said, ignoring him. You don't really have a chance. Nobody does with a whole nation in on the manhunt and with the incredibly sophisticated equipment and training that the hunters have. But if you stay low, you'll last longer. Use your legs instead of any weapons you happen to pick up. And stay close to your own people. He leveled a finger at Richards in emphasis. Not these good middle-class folks out there. They hate your guts. You symbolize all the fears of this dark and broken time. It wasn't all show and audience backing out there, Richards. They hate your guts. Could you feel it? Yes, Richards said. I felt it. I hate them, too. Killian smiled. That's why they're killing you. He took Richards' arm. His grip was surprisingly strong. This way. Behind them, Laughlin was being ragged by Bobby Thompson to the audience's satisfaction. Down a white corridor, their footfalls echoing hollowly. Alone. All alone. One elevator at the end. This is where you and I part company, Killian said. Express through the street, nine seconds. He offered his hand for the fourth time, and Richards refused it again. Yet he lingered a moment. What if I could go up, he asked, and gestured with his head toward the ceiling, and the 80 stories above the ceiling. Who could I kill up there? Who could I kill if I went right to the top? Killian laughed softly and punched the button beside the elevator. The doors popped open. That's what I like about you, Richards. You think big. Richards stepped into the elevator. The doors slid toward each other. Stay low, Killian repeated. And then Richards was alone. The bottom dropped out of his stomach as the elevator sank toward the street. Minus 079 and counting. The elevator opened directly onto the street. A cop was standing by its frontage on Nixon Memorial Park, but he did not look at Richards as he stepped out, only tapped his move along reflectively and stared into the soft drizzle that filled the air. The drizzle had brought early dusk to the city. The lights glowed mystically through the darkness, and the people moving on Rampart Street in the shadow of the games building were only insubstantial shadows, as Richard knew he must be himself. He breathed deeply of the wet, sulfur-tainted air. It was good in spite of the taste. It seemed that he had just been let out of prison rather than from one communicating cell to another. The air was good. The air was fine. Stay close to your own people, Killian had said. Of course he was right. Richards hadn't needed Killian to tell him that or to know that the heat would be heaviest in Co-op City when the truce broke at noon tomorrow. But by then he would be over the hills and 
five blocks from his destination. When the cab dropped him, he would go backyard express to Moley's place. The cab accelerated, ancient gas-powered engine, a discordant symphony of pounding pistons and manifold noise. Richard slumped back against the vinyl cushions into what he hoped was deeper shadow. Hey, I just seen you on the freebie! The cabbie exclaimed, You're that guy Pritchard! Pritchard, that's right. Richard said resignedly. The game's building was dwindling behind them. A psychological shadow seemed to be dwindling proportionally in his mind in spite of the bad luck with the cabbie. Jesus, you got balls, buddy, I'll say that. You really do. Christ, they'll kill you, you know that? They'll kill you fucking I dead. You must really have balls. That's right, two of them, just like you. Two of them? The cabbie repeated. He was ecstatic. Jesus, that's good. That's hot. You mind if I tell my wife I had you as a fair? She goes batching for the games. I have to report you too, but Christ, I won't get no hundred for it. Cabbie's got to have at least one supporting witness, you know. Knowing my luck, no one saw you getting in. That would be tough, Richard said. I'm sorry you can't help kill me. Should I leave a note saying I was here? Jesus, could you? That'd be... They had just crossed the canal. Let me out here, Richard said abruptly. He pulled a new dollar from the envelope Thompson had handed him and dropped it on the front seat. Gee, I didn't say nothing, did I? I didn't mean to... No, Richard said. Could you give me that note? Get stuffed, maggot. He lunged out and began walking toward Drummond Street. Co-op City rose skeletal in the gathering darkness before him. The cabbie's yell floated after him. I hope they get you early, you cheap fuck! Minus 078 and counting. Through a backyard. Through a ragged hole in a cyclone fence separating one barren asphalt desert from another. Across a ghostly abandoned construction site. Pausing far back in shattered shadows as a cycle pack roared by, headlamps glaring in the dark like the psychopathic eyes of nocturnal werewolves. Then over a final fence, cutting one hand, and he was rapping on Molly Jernigan's back door, which is to say the main entrance. Molly ran a Dock Street hawk shop where a fellow with enough bucks to spread around could buy a police special move along, a full choke riot gun, a submachine gun, heroin, bush, cocaine, drag disguises, a styroflex pseudo woman, a real whore if you were too strapped to afford styroflex, the current address of one of three floating crap games, the current address on a swinging perverto club, or a hundred other illegal items. If Molly didn't have what you wanted, he would order it for you, including false papers. When he opened the peephole and saw who was there, he offered a kindly smile and said, Why don't you go away, pal? I never saw you. New dollars, Richards remarked, as if to the air itself. There was a pause. Richards studied the cuff of his shirt as if he had never seen it before. Then the bolts and locks were opened quickly, as if Molly were afraid Richards would change his mind. Richards came in. They were in Molly's place behind the store, which was a rat warren of old newsies, stolen musical instruments, stolen cameras, and boxes of black market groceries. Molly was, by necessity, something of a Robin Hood. A pawnbroker south of the canal did not remain in business long if he became too greedy. Molly took the rich uptown maggots as heavily as he could and sold in the neighborhood at close to cost, sometimes lower than cost if some pal was being squeezed hard. Thus, his reputation in Co-op City was excellent, his protection superb. If a cop asked a South City stoolie, and there were hundreds of them, about Molly Jernigan, the informant let it be known that Molly was a slightly senile old-timer who took a little graft and sold a little black market. Any number of uptown swells with strange sexual tendencies could have told the police differently, but there were no vice busts anymore. Everyone knew vice was bad for any real revolutionary climate. The fact that Molly also ran a moderately profitable trade in forged documents, strictly for local customers, was unknown uptown. Still, Richards knew, tooling papers for someone as hot as he was would be extremely dangerous. What papers? Molly asked, sighing deeply and turning on an ancient gooseneck lamp that flooded the working area of his desk with bright white light. He was an old man, approaching 75, and in the close glow of the light, his hair looked like spun silver. Driver's license, military service card, street identity card, axial charge card, social retirement card. Easy. Sixty buck job for anyone but you, Benny. You'll do it. For your wife, I'll do it. For you, no. I don't put my head in the news for any crazy-ass bastard like Benny Richards. How long, Molly? Molly's eyes flashed sardonically. Knowing your situation as I do, I'll hurry it. An hour for each. Christ, five hours. Can I go? No, you can't. Are you not 
Thanks, Benny. A cop comes pulling up to your development last week. He's got an envelope for your old lady. He came in a black wagon with about six buddies. Flapper Donegan was standing on the corner pitching nicks with Jerry Hanrahan when it transpired. Flapper tells me everything. The boy's soft, you know. I know Flapper's soft. Richard said impatiently, I sent the money. Is she? Who knows? Who sees? Molly shrugged and rolled his eyes as he put pens and blank forms in the center of the pool of light thrown by the lamp. They're four deep around your building, Benny. Anyone who's sent to offer their condolences would end up in a cellar talking to a bunch of rubber clubs. Even good friends don't need that scam, not even with your old lady flush. You got a name you want special on these? Doesn't matter as long as it's Anglo. Jesus moly, she must have come out for groceries. And the doctor? She sent Buncio Sanchez's kid. What's his name? Walt. Yeah, that's it. I can't keep the guy of Spix and Mix straight no more. I'm getting senile, Benny. Blowing my cool. He glared up at Richard suddenly. I remember when Mick Jagger was a big name. You don't even know who he was, do you? I know who he was, Richard said, distraught. He turned to Molly's sidewalk level window, frightened. It was worse than he thought. Sheila and Kathy were in the cage too, at least until... They're okay, Benny, Molly said softly. Just stay away. You're poison to them now. Can you dig it? Yes, Richard said. He was suddenly overwhelmed with despair, black and awful. I'm homesick, he thought, amazed. But it was more. It was worse. Everything seemed out of whack, surreal. The very fabric of existence, bulging at the seams, faces whirling. Laughlin, Burns, Killian, Jansky, Molly, Kathy, Sheila. He looked out into the blackness, trembling. Molly had gone to work, crooning some old song from his vacant past. Something about having Betty Davis eyes. Who the hell was that? He was a drummer, Richard said suddenly. With that English group, the Beatles, Mick McCartney. Yeah, you kids, Molly said, bent over his work. That's all you kids know. Minus 077 and counting. He left Molly's at 10 past midnight, 1,200 new dollars lighter. The pawnbroker had also sold him a limited but fairly effective disguise. Gray hair, spectacles, mouth wadding, plastic buck teeth, which subtly transfigured his lip line. Give yourself a little limp, too, Molly advised. Not a big attention getter, just a little one. Remember, you have the power to cloud men's minds if you use it. Don't remember that line, do you? Richards didn't. According to his new wallet cards, he was John Griffin Springer, a text tape salesman from Harding. He was a 43-year-old widower. No Technico status, but that was just as well. Technicos had their own language. Richards re-emerged on Robard Street at 12.30. A good hour to get rolled, mugged, or killed, but a bad hour to make any kind of unnoticed getaway. Still, he had lived south of the canal all his life. He crossed the canal two miles farther west, almost on the edge of the lake. He saw a party of drunken winos huddled around a furtive fire, several rats, but no cops. By 1.15 a.m., he was cutting across the far edge of the no-man's land of warehouses, cheap beaneries, and shipping offices on the north side of the canal. At 1.30, he was surrounded by enough uptowners hopping from one sleazy dive to the next to safely hail a cab. This time, the driver didn't give him a second look. Jetport, Richard said. I'm your man, pal. The air thrusters shoved them up into traffic. They were at the airport by 1.50. Richards limped past several cops and security guards who showed no interest in him. He bought a ticket to New York because it came naturally to mind. The ID check was routine and uneventful. He was on the 220 speed shuttle to New York. There were only 40 or so passengers, most of them snoozing businessmen and students. The cop in the Judas hole dozed through the entire trip. After a while, Richards dozed too. They touched down at 3.06, and Richards deplaned and left the airport without incident. At 3.15, the cab was spiraling down the Lindsay overway. They crossed Central Park on a diagonal. At a 3.20, Ben Richards disappeared into the largest city on the face of the earth. Minus 076 and counting. He went to earth in the Brandt Hotel, the so-so establishment on the east side. That part of the city had been gradually entering a new cycle of chic. Yet the Brandt was less than a mile from Manhattan's own blighted inner city, also the largest in the world. As he checked in, he again thought of Dan Killian's parting words. Stay close to your own people. After leaving the taxi, he had walked to Times Square, not wanting to check into any hotel during the small morning hours. He spent the five and a half hours 
from 3.30 to 9 o'clock in an all-night pervert show. He had wanted desperately to sleep, but both times he had dozed off, he had been snapped awake by the feel of light fingers crawling up his inner thigh. How long will you be staying, sir? The desk clerk asked, glancing at Richards' registration as John G. Springer. No, no, Richard said, trying for meek affability. All depends on the clients, you understand. He paid 60 new dollars, holding the room for two days, and took the elevator up to the 23rd floor. The room offered a somber view of the squalid East River. It was raining in New York, too. The room was clean but sterile. There was a connecting bathroom, and the toilet made constant ominous noises that Richards could not rectify even by wiggling the ball in the tank. He had breakfast set up, a poached egg on toast, orange drink, coffee. When the boy appeared with the tray, he tipped lightly and forgettably. With breakfast out of the way, he took out the videotape camera and looked at it. A small metal plate labeled Instructions was set just below the viewfinder, Richards read. One, push tape cartridge into slot marked A until it clicks home. Two, set viewfinder by means of crosshairs within the sight. Three, push button marked B to record sound with video. Four, when the bell sounds, tape cartridge will pop out automatically. Recording time, 10 minutes. Good, Richards thought, they can watch me sleep. He set the camera on the bureau next to the Gideon Bible and sighted the crosshairs on the bed. The wall behind was blank and nondescript. He didn't see how anyone could pinpoint his location from either the bed or the background. Street noise from this height was negligible, but he would leave the shower running just in case. Even with forethought, he nearly pressed the button and stepped into the camera's field of vision with his naked disguise hanging out. Some of it could have been removed, but the gray hair had to stay. He put the pillow slip over his head. Then he pressed the button, walked over to the bed, and sat down facing the lens. Peekaboo, Ben Richards said hollowly to his immense listening and viewing audience that would watch this tape later tonight with horrified interest. You can't see it, but I'm laughing at you shit-eaters. He lay back, closed his eyes, and tried to think of nothing at all. When the tape clip popped out ten minutes later, he was fast asleep. Yeesh, what the hell's up with you? He put the pillow slip over his minus 075 and counting. When he woke up, it was just after 4 p.m. The hunt was on then. Had been for three hours, figuring for the time difference. The thought sent a chill through his middle. He put a new tape in the camera, took down the Gideon Bible, and read the Ten Commandments over and over for ten minutes with the pillow slip on his head. There were envelopes in the desk drawer, but the name and address of the hotel was on them. He hesitated and knew it made no difference. He would have to take Killian's word that his location, as revealed by postmarks or return addresses, would not be revealed to McCone and his bird dogs by the game's authority. He had to use the postal service. They had supplied him with no carrier pigeons. There was a mail drop at the elevators, and Richards dropped the clips into the out-of-town slot with huge misgivings. Although postal authorities were not eligible for any games money for reporting the whereabouts of contestants, it still seemed like a horribly risky thing to do. But the only other thing was default, and he couldn't do that either. He went back to his room, shut off the shower, the bathroom was as steamy as a tropical jungle, and lay down on the bed to think. How to run? What was the best thing to do? He tried to put himself in the place of an average contestant. The first impulse, of course, was pure animal instinct. Go to Earth, make a den, and cower in there. And so he had done the Brant Hotel. Would the hunters expect that? Yes. They would not be looking for a running man at all. They would be looking for a hiding man. Could they find him in his den? He wanted very badly to answer no, but he could not. His disguise was good, but hastily put together. Not many people are observant, but there are always some. Perhaps he had been tapped already. The desk clerk. The bellboy who had brought his breakfast. Perhaps even by one of the faceless men in the perverto show on 42nd Street. Not likely, but possible. And what about his real protection? The false ID Moley had provided. Good for how long? 
Well, the taxi driver who had taken him from the games building could put him in South City. And the hunters were fearfully, dreadfully good. They would be leaning hard on everyone he knew, from Jack Crager to that bitch Eileen Jenner down the hall. Heavy heat. How long until somebody, maybe a head softy like Flapper Donegan, let it slip that Moley had forged papers on occasion? And if they found Moley, he was blown. The pawnbroker would hold out long enough to take a building around. He was canny enough to want a few visible battle scars to sport around the neighborhood, just so his place didn't have a bad case of spontaneous combustion some night. Then, a simple check of Harding's three jet ports would uncover John G. Springer's midnight jaunt to Freak City. If they found Moley, you assume they will. You have to assume they will. Then run. Where? He didn't know. He had spent his entire life in Harding, in the Midwest. He didn't know the East Coast. There was no place here he could run to and feel that he was on familiar turf. So where? Where? His teased and unhappy mind drifted into a morbid daydream. They had found Moley with no trouble at all. Pried the Springer name out of him in an easy five minutes after pulling two fingernails, filling his navel with lighter fluid and threatening to strike a match. They had gotten Richards' flight number with one quick call, had some nondescript men in gabardine coats of identical cut and make, and had arrived in New York by 2.30 EST. Advanced men had already gotten the address of the brand by a telex canvas of the New York City hotel listings, which were computer tabulated day by day. They were outside now, surrounding the place. Busboys and bellboys and clerks and bartenders had been replaced by hunters, half a dozen coming up the fire escape. Another 50 packing all three elevators. More and more pulling up in air cars all around the building. Now they were in the hall, and in a moment the door would crash open and they would lunge in, a tape machine grinding enthusiastically away on a rolling tripod above their muscular shoulders, getting it all down for posterity as they turned him into hamburger. Richards sat up, sweating. Didn't even have a gun, not yet. Run. Fast. Boston would do. To start. Minus 074 and counting. He left his room at 5 p.m. and went down to the lobby. The desk clerk smiled brightly, probably looking forward to his evening relief. Afternoon, Mr. Uh, Springer. Richard smiled back. I seem to have struck oil, my man. Three clients who seem receptive. I'll be occupying your excellent facility for an additional two days. May I pay in advance? Certainly, sir. Dollars changed hands. Still beaming, Richards went back up to his room. The hall was empty. Richards hung the Do Not Disturb sign on the doorknob and went quickly to the fire stairs. Luck was with him, and he met no one. He went all the way to the ground floor and slipped out the side entrance unobserved. The rain had stopped, but the clouds still hung and lowered over Manhattan. The air smelled like a rancid battery. Richards walked briskly, discarding the limp, to the Port Authority electric bus terminal. A man could still buy a ticket on a Greyhound without signing his name. Boston, he said to the bearded ticket vendor. Twenty-three bucks, pal. Bus pulls out at 6.15, sharp. He passed over the money. It left him with something less than 3,000 new dollars. He had an hour to kill, and the terminal was chock full of people, many of them Vol Army, with their blue berets and blank, boyish, brutal faces. He bought a pervert mag, sat down, and propped it in front of his face. For the next hour, he stared at it, turning a page occasionally to try and avoid looking like a statue. When the bus rolled up to the pier, he shuffled toward the open doors with the rest of the nondescript assortment. Hey, hey you! Richard stared around. A security cop was approaching on the run. He froze, unable to take flight. A distant part of his brain was screaming that he was about to be cut down right here, right here in this shitty bus terminal with wads of gum on the floor and casual obscenities scrawled on the dirt-caked walls. He was going to be some dumb Flatfoot's fluke trophy. Stop him! Stop that guy! The cop was veering. It wasn't him at all. Richard saw it was a scruffy-looking kid who was running for the stairs, swinging a lady's purse in one hand and bowling bystanders this way and that like ten pins. He and his pursuer disappeared from sight, taking the stairs three by three in huge leaps. The knot of embarkers, debarkers, and greeters watched them with vague interest for a moment and then picked up the threads of what they had been doing as if nothing had happened. 
Richards stood in line, trembling and cold. He collapsed into a seat at the back of the coach, and a few minutes later the bus hummed smoothly up the ramp, paused, and joined the flow of traffic. The cop and his quarry had disappeared into the general mob of humanity. If I'd had a gun, I would have burned him where he stood, Richards thought. Christ, oh Christ. And on the heels of that, next time it won't be a purse snatcher, it'll be you. He would get a gun in Boston anyway, somehow. He remembered Laughlin saying that he would push a few of them out a high window before they took him. The bus rolled north in the gathering darkness. Minus 073 and counting. The Boston YMCA stood on Upper Huntington Avenue. It was huge, black with years, old-fashioned and boxy. It stood in what used to be one of Boston's better areas in the middle of the last century. It stood there like a guilty reminder of another time, another day. Its old-fashioned neon still winking its letters toward the sinful theater district. It looked like the skeleton of a murdered idea. When Richards walked into the lobby, the desk clerk was arguing with a tiny, scruffy black boy in a kill ball jersey so big that it reached down over his blue jeans to mid-shin. The disputed territory seemed to be a gum machine that stood inside the lobby door. I lost my nickel, honky. I lost my muffling nickel. If you don't get out of here, I'll call the house detective, kid. That's all. I'm done talking to you. But that goddamn machine took my nickel. You stop swearing at me, you little scumbag. The clerk, who looked an old, cold 30, reached down and shook the jersey. It was too huge for him to be able to shake the boy inside, too. Now get out of here. I'm through talking. Seeing he meant it, the almost comic mask of hate and defiance below the dark sunburst of the kid's afro broke into a hurt, agonized grimace of disbelief. Listen, that's the only motherfucking nickel I got. That gumball machine ate my nickel, that... I'm calling the house dick right now. The clerk turned toward the switchboard. His jacket, a refugee from some bargain counter, flapped tiredly around his thin butt. The boy kicked the black steel post of the gun machine, then ran. My fucking white honky, some bitch! The clerk looked after him. The security button, real or mythical, unpressed. He smiled at Richards, showing an old keyboard with a few missing keys. You can't talk to niggers anymore. I'd keep them in cages if I ran the network. He really lose a nickel? Richards asked, signing the register as John Deegan from Michigan. If he did, he stole it, the clerk said. Oh, I suppose he did. But if I gave him a nickel, I'd have 200 pickaninnies in here by nightfall claiming the same thing. Where do they learn that language? That's what I want to know. Don't their folks care what they do? How long will you be staying, Mr. Deegan? I don't know. I've been down on business. He tried on a greasy smile. And when it felt right, he widened it. The desk clerk recognized it instantly. Perhaps from his own reflection looking up at him from the depths of the fake marble counter, which had been polished by a million elbows, and gave it back to him. That's fifteen dollars fifty cents, Mr. Deegan. He pushed a key attached to a worn wooden tongue across the counter to Richards. Room 512. Thank you. Richards paid cash. Again, no ID. Thank God for the YMCA. He crossed to the elevators and looked down the corridor to the Christian Lending Library on the left. It was dimly lit with fly-specked yellow globes, and an old man wearing an overcoat and galoshes was perusing a tract, turning the pages slowly and methodically with a trembling, wetted finger. Richards could hear the clogged whistle of his breathing from where he was by the elevators, and felt a mixture of sorrow and horror. The elevator clunked to a stop, and the doors opened with wheezy reluctance. As he stepped in, the clerk said loudly, It's a sin and a shame. I'd put them all in cages. Richards glanced up, thinking the clerk was speaking to him, but the clerk was not looking at anything. The lobby was very empty and very silent. Minus 072 and counting. The fifth floor hall stank of pee. The corridor was narrow enough to make Richards feel claustrophobic and the carpet, which might have been red, had worn away in the middle to random strings. The doors were industrial gray, and several of them showed the marks of fresh kicks, smashes, or attempts to jimmy. Signs at every 
everybody bases advised that there would be no smoking in this hall by order of fire marshal. There was a communal bathroom in the center, and the urine stench became suddenly sharp. It was a smell Richards associated automatically with despair. People moved restlessly behind the gray doors like animals in cages, animals too awful, too frightening to be seen. Someone was chanting what might have been the Hail Mary over and over in a drunken voice. Strange gobbling noises came from behind another door. A country western tune from behind another. I ain't got a buck for the phone, and I'm so alone. Shuffling noises. The solitary squeak of bed springs that might mean a man in his own hand. Sobbing. Laughter. The hysterical grunts of a drunken argument. And from behind these, silence, and silence, and silence. A man with a hideously sunken chest walked past Richards without looking at him, carrying a bar of soap and a towel in one hand, wearing gray pajama bottoms tied with string. He wore paper slippers on his feet. Richards unlocked his room and stepped in. There was a police bar on the inside and he used it. There was a bed with almost white sheets and an army surplus blanket. There was a bureau from which the second drawer was missing. There was a picture of Jesus on one wall. There was a steel rod with two coat hangers kitty cornered in the right angle of two walls. There was nothing else but the window, which looked out on blackness. It was 10.15. Richards hung up his jacket, slipped off his shoes, and lay down on the bed. He realized how miserable and unknown and vulnerable he was in the world. The universe seemed to shriek and clatter and roar around him like a huge and indifferent jalopy rushing down a hill and toward the lip of a bottomless chasm. His lips began to tremble, and then he cried a little. He didn't put it on tape. He lay looking at the ceiling, which was cracked into a million crazy scrawls like a bad potter's lace. They had been after him for over eight hours now. He had earned eight hundred dollars of his stake money. Christ, not even out of the hole yet. And he'd missed himself on freebie. Christ, yes, the bag over the head spectacular. Where were they? Still in Harding, New York? Or on their way to Boston? No, they couldn't be on their way here, could they? The bus had not passed through any roadblocks. He had left the biggest city in the world anonymously, and he was here under an assumed name. They couldn't be on to him, no way. The Boston Y might be safe for as long as two days. After that, he could move north toward New Hampshire and Vermont, or south toward Hartford or Philadelphia, or even Atlanta. Further east was the ocean, and beyond it was Britain and Europe. It was an intriguing idea, but probably out of reach. Passage by plane required ID, but with France under martial law. And while stowing away might be possible, discovery would mean a quick and final end of the whole thing west was out. West was where the heat was the hottest. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Who had said that? Moley would know. He snickered a little and felt better. The disembodied sound of a radio came to his ears. It would be good to get the gun now, tonight, but he was too tired. The ride had tired him. Being a fugitive tired him. And he knew in an animal way that went deeper than the rational. That very soon he might be sleeping in an October cold culvert cinder choked gully. The gun tomorrow night. He turned off the light and went to bed. Minus 071 and counting. It was showtime again. Richard stood with his buttocks toward the video recorder, humming the theme music to the running man. A YMCA pillow slip was over his head, turned inside out so the name stamped on its hem wouldn't show. The camera had inspired Richards to a kind of creative humor that he never would have believed he possessed. The self-image he'd always held was that of a rather doer man with little or no humor in his outlook. The prospect of his approaching death had uncovered a solitary comedian hiding inside. When the clip popped out, he decided to save the second for afternoon. The solitary room was boring.
it would be okay. He went down with a towel over his shoulder, met no one, and walked into the bathroom. Essence of urine, shit, puke, and disinfectant mingled. All the crapper doors had been yanked off, of course. Someone had scrawled fuck the network in foot-high letters above the urinal. It looked as though he might have been angry when he did it. There was a pile of feces in one of the urinals. Someone must have been really drunk, Richards thought. A few sluggish autumn flies were crawling over it. He was not disgusted, the sight was too common. But he was matter-of-factly glad he had worn his shoes. He also had the shower room to himself. The floor was cracked porcelain. The walls gouged tile with thick runnels of decay near the bottoms. He turned on a rest-clogged shower head full hot and waited patiently for five minutes until the water ran tepid and then showered quickly. He used a scrap of soap he found on the floor. The Y had either neglected to supply it or the chambermaid had walked off with his. On his way back to his room, a man with a hair lip gave him a tract. Richards tucked his shirt in, sat on his bed, and lit a cigarette. He was hungry, but would wait until dusk to go out and eat. Boredom drove him to the window again. He counted different makes of cars. Fords, Chevys, Wints, VWs, Plymouths, Studebakers, Rambler Supremes. First one to a hundred wins. A dull game, but better than no game. Further up Huntington Avenue was Northeastern University, and directly across the street from the Y was a large automated bookshop. While he counted cars, Richards watched the students come and go. They were in sharp contrast to the wanted fax idlers. Their hair was shorter, and they all seemed to be wearing tartan jumpers, which were this year's campus craze. They walked through the milling ruck and inside to make their purchases with an air of uncomfortable. Beside to make their purchases with an air of uncomfortable patronization and hail fellow that left a curdled amusement in Richards' mouth. The five-minute spaces in front of the store filled and emptied with sporty, flashy cars, often of exotic make. Most of them had college decals in the back windows, Northeastern, MIT, Boston College, Harvard. Most of the news facts bums treated the sporty cars as part of the scenery, but a few looked at them with dumb and wretched longing. A wind pulled out of the space directly in front of the store, and a Ford pulled in, settling to an inch above the pavement as the driver, a crew-cut fellow smoking a foot-long cigar, put it in idle. Dipped slightly as his passenger, a dude in a brown and white hunting jacket, got out and zipped inside. Richard sighed. Counting cars was a very poor game. Fords were ahead of their nearest contender by a score of 78 to 40. The outcome, going to be predictable, is the next election. Someone pounded on the door, and Richard stiffened like a bolt. Frankie, you in there, Frankie? Richard said nothing. Frozen with fear, he played the statue. You eat shit, Frankie, baby. There was a chortle of drunken laughter, and the footsteps moved on, pounding on the next door up. You in there, Frankie? Richards' heart slipped slowly down from his throat. The Ford was pulling out, and another Ford took its place. Number 79. Shit. The day slipped into afternoon, and then it was one o'clock. Richards knew this by the ringing of various chimes in churches far away. Ironically, the man living by the clock had no watch. He was playing a variation of the car game now. Fordsworth two points, Studebaker's three, wins four. First one to five hundred wins. It was perhaps fifteen minutes later that he noticed the young man in the brown and white hunting jacket leaning against a lamppost beyond the bookstore and reading a concert poster. He was not being moved along. In fact, the police seemed to be ignoring him. You're jumping at shadows, maggot. Next you'll see them in the corners. He counted a win with a dented fender. A yellow Ford. An old Studebaker with a wheezing air cylinder dipping in slight cycles. A VW. No good. They're out of the running. Another wind. A Studebaker. A man smoking a foot-long cigar was standing nonchalantly at the bus stop on the corner. He was the only person there. With good reason. Richards had seen the buses come and go and knew there wouldn't be another one along for 45 minutes. Richards felt a coolness creep into his testicles. An old man in a threadbare black overcoat sauntered down the side of the street and leaned casually against the building. Two fellows in tartan jumpers got out of a taxi, talking animatedly, and began to study the menu in the window of the Stockholm restaurant. A cop walked over and conversed with the man at the bus stop. Then the cop walked away again. Richards noted with a dumb, distant terror that a good many of the newspaper bums were idling along much more slowly. Their clothes and styles 
of walking seemed oddly familiar, as if they had been around a great many times before, and Richards was just becoming aware of it, in the tentative, uneasy way you recognize the voices of the dead in dreams. There were more cops, too. I'm being bracketed, he thought. The idea brought a helpless rabbit terror. No, his mind corrected. You've already been bracketed. Minus 070 and counting. Richards walked rapidly to the bathroom, being calm, ignoring his terror the way a man on a high ledge ignores the drop. If he was going to get out of this, it would be by keeping his head. If he panicked, he would die quickly. Someone was in the shower, singing a popular song in a cracked and pitchless voice. No one was at the urinals or the washstands. The trick had popped effortlessly into his mind as he had stood by the window, watching them gather in their offhand, sinister way. If it hadn't occurred to him, he thought he would be there yet, like Aladdin watching smoke from the lamp coalesce into an omnipotent gin. They had used the trick as boys to steal newspapers from development basements. Molly bought them two cents a pound. He took one of the wire toothbrush holders off the wall with a hard snap of his wrist. It was a little rusted, but that wouldn't matter. He walked down to the elevator, bending the toothbrush holder out straight. He pushed the call button, and the cage took a slow eternity to come down from eight. It was empty. Thank Christ it was empty. He stepped in, looked briefly down the halls, and then turned to the control panel. There was a key slot beside the button marked for the basement. The janitor would have a special card to shove in there. An electric eye scanned the card, and then the janitor could push the button and ride down to the basement. What if it doesn't work? Never mind that, never mind that now. Grimacing in anticipation of a possible electric shock, Richards jammed the toothbrush wire into the slot and pushed the basement button simultaneously. There was a noise from inside the control panel that sounded like a brief electronic curse. There was a light tingling jolt up his arm for a moment, nothing else. Then the folding brass gate slid across, the doors closed, and the elevator lurched unhappily downward. A small tendril of blue smoke curled out of the slot in the panel. Richards stood away from the elevator door and watched the numbers flash backwards. When the L lit, the motor high above made a grinding sound, and the car seemed about to stop. Then after a moment, perhaps after it thought it had scared Richards enough, It descended again. Twenty seconds later, the doors slid open, and Richard stepped out into the huge, dim basement. There was water dripping somewhere, and the scurry of a disturbed rat, but otherwise the basement was his. For now. Minus 069 and counting. Huge, rusted heating pipes, festooned with cobwebs, crawled crazily all over the ceiling. When the furnace kicked on suddenly, Richards almost screamed in terror. The surge of adrenaline to his limbs and heart was painful for a moment, almost incapacitating. There were newspapers here, too, Richards saw. Thousands of them stacked up and tied with string. The rats had nested in them by the thousands. Whole families stared out at the interloper with ruby, distrustful eyes. He began to walk away from the elevator, pausing halfway across the cracked cement floor. There was a large fuse box bolted to a supporting post, and behind it, leaning against the other side, a litter of tools. Richards took the crowbar and continued to walk, keeping his eyes on the floor. Near the far wall, he spied the main storm drain to his left. He walked over and looked at it, wondering in the back of his mind if they knew he was down here yet. The storm drain was constructed of vented steel. It was about three feet across. And on the far side, there was a slot for the crowbar. Richard slipped it in, levered up the cover, and then put one foot on the crowbar to hold it. He got his hands under the lip of the cover and pushed it over. It fell to the cement with a clang that made the rats squeak with dismay. The pipe beneath slanted down at a 45-degree angle, and Richards guessed that its bore could be no more than two and a half feet. It was very dark. Claustrophobia suddenly filled his mouth with flannel. Too small to maneuver in, almost too small to breathe in, but it had to be. He turned the storm drain cover back over and edged it toward the pipe entrance just enough so he could grip it from beneath once he was down there. Then he walked over to the fuse box, hammered the padlock off with the crowbar, and shoved it open. He was about to begin pulling fuses when another idea occurred to him. He walked over to the newspapers, which lay in dirty yellow drifts against the whole eastern
eastern length of the cellar. Then he ferreted out the folded and dog-eared book of matches he had been lighting his smokes with. There were three left. He yanked out a sheet of paper and formed it into a spill, held it under his arm like a dunce cap, and lit a match. The first one guttered out in a draft. The second fell out of his trembling hand and kissed out on the damp concrete. The third stayed alight. He held it to his paper spill, and yellow flame bloomed. A rat, perhaps sensing what was to come, ran across his foot and into the darkness. A terrible sense of urgency filled him now, and yet he waited until the spill was flaming a foot high. He had no more matches. Carefully he tucked it into a fissure in the chest-high paper wall, and waited until he saw that the fire was spreading. The huge oil tank which serviced the Y was built into the adjoining wall. Perhaps it would blow. Richards thought it would. Trotting up, he went back to the fuse box and began ripping out the long tubular fuses. He got most of them before the basement lights went out. He felt his way across to the storm drain, aided by the growing, flickering light of the burning papers. He sat down with his feet dangling and then slowly eased in. When his head was below the level of the floor, he pressed his knees against the sides of the pipe to hold himself steady and worked his arms up above his head. It was slow work. There was very little room to move. The light of the fire was brilliant yellow now, and the crackling sound of burning filled his ears. Then his groping fingers found the lip of the drain, and he slid them up until they gripped the vented cover. He yanked it forward slowly, supporting more and more of the weight with the muscles of his back and neck. When he judged that the far edge of the cover was on the edge of dropping into place, he gave one last fierce tug. The cover dropped into place with a clang, bending both wrists back cruelly. Richards let his knees relax, and he slid downward like a boy shooting the chutes. The pipe was coated with slime, and he slid effortlessly about twelve feet to where the pipe elbow bent into a straight line. His feet struck smartly, and he stood there like a drunk leaning against a lamp post. But he couldn't get into the horizontal pipe. The elbow bend was too sharp. The taste of the claustrophobia became huge, gagging. Trapped, his mind babbled. Trapped in here, trapped, trapped. A steel scream rose in his throat, and he choked it down. Calm down. Sure, it's very hackneyed, very trite. But we must be very calm down here. Very calm, because we are at the bottom of this pipe, and we can't get up, and we can't get down. And if the fucking oil tank goes boom, we are going to be fricasseed very neatly, and... Slowly, he began to wriggle around until his chest was against the pipe instead of his back. The slime coating acted as a lubricant, helping his movement. It was very bright in the pipe now and getting warmer. The vented cover threw prison bar shadows on his struggling face. Hmm. Once leaning against his chest and belly and groin with his knees bending the right way, he could slip down further, letting his calves and feet slide into the horizontal pipe until he was in the praying position. Still no good, his buttocks were pushing against the solid ceramic facing above the entrance to the horizontal pipe. Faintly, it seemed that he could hear shouted commands above the heavy crackle of the fire, but it might have been his imagination, which was now strained and fevered beyond the point of trust. He began to flex the muscles of his thighs and calves in a tiring seesaw rhythm, and little by little his knees began to slide out from under him. He worked his hands up over his head again to give himself more room, and now his face lay solidly against the slime of the pipe. He was very close to fitting now. He swayed his back as much as he could and began to push with his arms and head, the only things left in any position to give him leverage. When he had begun to think there was not enough room that he was going to simply hang here, unable to move either way, his hips and buttocks suddenly popped through the horizontal pipe's opening like a champagne cork from a tight bottleneck. The small of his back scraped excruciatingly as his knees slid out from under him, and his shirt rucked up to his shoulder blades. Then he was in the horizontal pipe, except for his head and arms, which were bent back at a joint twisting angle. He wriggled the rest of the way in, and then paused there, panting, his face streaked with slime and rat droppings, the skin of his lower back abraded and oozing blood. His pipe was narrower still. His shoulders scraped lightly on both sides each time his chest rose in respiration. Thank God I'm underfed. Panting, he began to back into the unknown darkness of the pipe. Minus 068 and counting. He made slow, mole-like progress for about 50 yards through the horizontal pipe, backing up blindly. 
Then the oil tank in the Wyeth's basement suddenly blew with a roar that set up enough sympathetic vibrations in the pipes to nearly rupture his eardrums. There was a yellow-white flash as if a pile of phosphorus had ignited. It faded to a rosy, shifting glow. A few moments later, a blast of thermal air struck him in the face, making him grin painfully. The tape camera in his jacket pocket swung and bounced as he tried to back up faster. The pipe was picking up heat from the fierce explosion and fire that was raging somewhere above him, the way the handle of a skillet picks up heat from a gas ring. Richards had no urge to be baked down here like a potato in a Dutch oven. Sweat rolled on his face, mixing with the black streaks of orchard already there, making him look in the waxing and waning glow of the reflected fire like an Indian painted for war. The sides of the pipe were hot to the touch now. Lobster-like, Richards humped backwards on his knees and forearms, his buttocks rising to smack the top of the pipe at every movement. His breath came in sharp, dog-like gasps. The air was hot, full of the slick taste of oil, uncomfortable to breathe. A headache surfaced within his skull and began to push daggers into the backs of his eyes. I'm going to fry in here. I'm going to fry. Then his feet were suddenly dangling in the air. Richards tried to peer through his legs and see what was there, but it was too dark behind and his eyes were too dazzled by the light in front. He would have to take his chance. He backed up until his knees were on the edge of the pipe's ending and then slid them cautiously over. His shoes were suddenly in water, cold and shocking after the heat of the pipe. The new pipe ran at right angles to the one Richards had just come through, and it was much larger, big enough to stand in bent over. The thick, slowly moving water came up over his ankles. He paused for just a moment to stare back into the tiny pipe with its soft circle of reflected fire glow. The fact that he could see any glow at all from this distance meant that it must have been a very big bang indeed. Richards reluctantly forced himself to know it would be their job to assume him alive rather than dead in the inferno of the YMCA basement. But perhaps they would not discover the way he had taken until the fire was under control. That seemed a safe assumption, but it had seemed safe to assume that they could not trace him to Boston, too. Maybe they didn't. After all, what did you really see? No, it had been them. He knew it. The hunters. They had even carried the odor of evil. It had wafted up to his fifth floor room on invisible psychic thermals. A rat dog paddled past him, pausing to look up briefly with glittering eyes. Richard splashed clumsily off after it in the direction the water was flowing. Minus 067 and counting. Richard stood by the ladder, looking up, dumbfounded by the light. No regular traffic, which was something but light. The light was surprising because it had seemed that he had been walking in the sewers for hours, piled upon hours. In the darkness, with no visual input and no sound but the gurgle of water, the occasional soft splash of a rat, and the ghostly thumpings in other pipes. What happens if someone flushes a john over my head? Richards wondered morbidly. Sheesh. Just does not want to continue. Oh, tip. My phone fucked up. Oh, okay. I was thinking about ending everything anyways. So... Maybe I should just call it a day. Cause, uh, yeah. I've done this long enough today, I believe. Oh, shit. Oh. Magical rush. Hooray. Just what I needed. Okay, uh I finish this level and then call it a night. At least for this game. I'll just, I'll desecrate. Man, you are so 
slow. Left me nothing. Ye gods. Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna survive long with this loadout. Oh, look at that. Ooh. Multiple health items hidden behind pillars. Yeah. See what this floor holds and call it quits. What do we get for it? Right? Oh, awesome. Well, it's not terrible. Oh, well, shouldn't use that. Oh, there it is. That's actually a good idea. I'm gonna see if the uh, the thing to release the master seal is here, and if it's well, not well, it has to be in the next layer. If it's not, then I am done. Well, I'm done anyways after this plane or whatever the fuck it is. Oh shit. Jeez, that was fast. Oh yeah, he's low on health. Bomb. Actually, what did this do? How much? 0.7, and this does... 0.5, right? 0.5. Well, actually, this is better. slow bullets. Anybody want to 
want to give me the aggravating brain, I wouldn't complain. the eye flare. What are you going to give me? Jesus Christ, is it me or is, am, I, am I just destroying everything? Fuck. Better item. I mean... Better, yeah, better weapon, book. I don't know what you want to call that fucking thing in the middle. Oh, okay, so. No, uh, breaking the master's seal, so. That sucks. Uh, that is quite enough for this this playthrough. Uh, I will probably stream more tomorrow and finish off the Running Man. Actually, how much longer? Did... Fucking phone. Wonder how much we had left of the book. Of course. Of course, you fucking reset everything. Oh, only four and a half hours left. Maybe we can knock this out in two days. Anyways, uh, I'll start over back from... We're on chapter 33. Um, but yeah. I will uh, see you all later. Have, have a good night, folks.